Number 10, American Civil War. In What If Captain America Number 1, Captain America first actually appeared in 1863 as a member of the Union in the American Civil War. This version of the Cap didn't actually receive his enhancements from a super soldier serum like he does in the mainline continuity. Instead, after being mortally wounded with an encounter with an exceedingly evil and racist version of Bucky Barnes, he's reborn by a version of Sam Wilson who was taken in by the Shawnee and who conjures an ancient eagle spirit that makes both Rogers and Barnes the same on the outside as they are on the inside. His suit was more Civil War War era appropriate, wearing a coat, pants, and boots of the era. His classic helmet was replaced by more of a headdress, with a shield made of an unknown bulletproof material. This version of Captain America could actually summon a spirit eagle that would fight on his behalf. The uniform was supposed to represent unity of all the peoples of America, which is what this Captain America fought for. Number 9, Spirit of 76. When the original Captain America and Bucky Barnes went missing in action in 1945, the role of Captain America was kept alive by William Nasland, who was formerly the hero known as the Spirit of 76. First showing up in Captain America Comics number 49, William took on the role after being asked by President Truman. He was given a version of the uniform that was extremely similar to the original. The only real difference is the shield that wasn't the original indestructible one. It instead was made of steel. William Nasland himself dedicated himself to being on par with the original Captain America. He just didn't have the powers. The suit's main function was to keep the idea of Captain America alive after the original's death. It also explained for comic fans why he he was still around in active service after he supposedly died. So there's that. Number 8. Azrael. After the extremely famous Batman moment where Bane broke Bruce Wayne's back, there was a need for someone to take up the Batman mantle. Bruce Wayne's choice ended up being John Paul Valley, otherwise known as the anti-hero Azrael. Due to his mental conditioning, while with the Order of Saint Dumas, he was a much more violent Asbat even allowing people to die. His suit reflected not only his violent tendencies, but the era in the 90s that it premiered in. John Paul created a gray, yellow, and blue battle suit with red accents. It had flamethrowers, gun batarangs, claws, and a night vision helmet. His violent ways forced the return of Batman, and the sweet suit was abandoned. But some of its capabilities would certainly have been useful in lots and lots of situations. Number 7. Superman Red Sun. We don't actually know a ton about the Batman of the Superman Red Sun story other than his origin. What I picked up from actually reading this comic is that this version of the Cape Crusader is a bit more of an improviser, making use of what he has more than being able to purchase absolutely everything he needs. His suit and even the Batcave actually kind of reflect this. It's less form fitting, being more like a coat and snow pants. And he even sports a Yushanka style cowl. He also had more pockets and pouches all over and is seen with a bat shaped axe grappling hook type weapon thingy. Due to his position as leader of a terrorist group, he carries bombs alongside his usual gear and he even had a Batman shaped dummy somewhere in one of those little tiny pockets. Number 6. Kingdom Come In the story Kingdom Come, we see a world set 20 years in the future when the noble great heroes had mostly all retired giving way to a younger generation of anti-heroes. Bruce Wayne had his identity revealed and had been crippled by Bane and Two-Face. This along with his natural human aging caused him to retire, but it's Batman and he will never fully be out of the game. He completely turned to the bat side, becoming the Batman, abandoning his real name and taking rule over Gotham City from his bat cave with an army of robotic bat knights. But this is a list about bat suits. His new bat suit is a mechanized power armor that allows Batman to fight in hand to hand combat despite his past injuries. The suit comes with grappling hooks, lasers, and sharp blades, and it can even allow Batman to fly. If that weren't enough, not only does it allow him to move like he once did, it actually gives him super strength as well. Number five, a Joker bat suit. What's the best way to attack Batman? You attack him personally. In the Joker War storyline, Joker does exactly that, stealing Bruce's money, his influence as Batman, and his weaponry and equipment. He even steals a version of the bat suit. What makes this even more of a personal attack is that this suit was meant to be a possible future bright knight suit. Joker modified the suit with a big smile over the bat symbol and ha ha's all over it. We first see the suit after it is shown that the Joker dug up the body of Alfred and reanimated it with the Joker toxin. Everything he is doing is to personally attack Bruce and this suit in combination with everything else was the perfect way to do that. Its use isn't helpful, its use is against Batman. Is that cheating? I mean, I don't know, you decide. Number four, Thanagarian armor. 
In the DC Justice miniseries, Batman ends up wearing a suit of Thanagarian armor to protect himself from Brainiac's mind control. This wasn't all this super sweet armor could do though. The armor is able to resist punches from Superman and it's designed for combat against the world's toughest villains. Like a lot of other useful Batman armors, this suit also has a propulsion and wing system that allows him to fly, helping him deal with many, many, many more threats. It is also very obviously a callback to the old Batmobile from the 1966 Batman live action series with the black metal red accent look. It's a shame we don't see more of it. Number 3. Augmentation Suit In a Batman and Robin New 52 storyline, Batman faces off against a villain called Terminus, trying to prevent him from destroying the world. Bruce faces Terminus in a new suit called the Augmentation Suit that is equipped inside the Batmobile. While we haven't seen much of this suit yet, it is more agile than Batman's other armored suits and it's capable of granting the man inside crazy super strength, the ability of flight, and it allows Batman to stop a nuclear missile dead in its tracks, which is really all I need to say. It's an incredibly advanced and strong bat suit, easily making it one of the most useful. Number 2. Rookie Bat Armor This point actually technically covers two suits. And this point actually technically covers two suits. And one is another mech suit. This isn't actually worn by Bruce Wayne. This suit actually appeared at the end of Endgame. The DC story Endgame, not Avengers Endgame, obviously. And is worn by none other than Jim Gordon when Bruce is missing and presumed dead. The super heavy bat suit and the small stealth suit inside of it were created by Powers Tech for the GCPD. It had digital camo, thermal imaging, an auto defibrillator, enhanced strength, cape shaped bomb shields, rocket thrust boots, anti gravity magnets boots, a tear gas cannon, a smoke pulse cannon, decibel defense, and a voice changer. It allowed the former commissioner to take the place of Batman for a short period of time. So, yeah, I'd say it's pretty good. Before we get on to the number one pick, I just want to say a quick thanks for me and all of us at Top 10 Nerd for watching, liking, and subscribing. Unlike Batman and the Bat Family, we appreciate and need your support all of the time, not just when things get difficult. Number 1. The Hellbat Suit So we all know Batman is just a dude in a bat suit. He has to use his ingenuity and skill to defeat threats that metahumans can face one on one. But when the threat is too great, the metahumans help him out. Enter the Hellbat Suit. Designed by the Justice League core members, the Hellbat Suit was actually forged by Superman inside the sun. The Hellbat armor allows Batman to fly, run at super speed, and emit huge energy blasts, while also boosting up his strength and durability. Obviously it has to have a downside or there's no reason he wouldn't wear it all the time. It slowly drains Bruce Wayne's life force and would actually kill him if he wore it too long. There's always a catch. Number 10. Dick Grayson's Bat Suit After the fall of Azrael Batman, Dick Grayson was the next best option, even if it wasn't what either him or Bruce wanted. Grayson made some significant changes to the Batsuit to better the suit to his style and preferences. For example, he said, No capes! Just like Edna Mode from The Incredibles. No, he, he didn't, but I wanted to say it. He did actually include a cape, but it was much lighter and had more specific parachute like functions. He changed the utility belt too, making it metal and streamlined. No longer a big pouchy leather belt, it had mechanical compartments instead. While not useful for any specific moment, it was useful in allowing Dick Grayson to take up the Batman mantle more effectively when he needed to. Number 9. The Hazbat Suit Batman is famous for being prepared for any situation. One such situation would be bioattacks, bioweapons, contagions, and other related issues. Of course Batman has a plan. The Robin named Hazbat Suit is a lightweight suit that protects Batman from any airborne contagion. It also has medical scanners that aid Batman in locating the source and counter agent to any infection he may be affected by. But this suit is not a pushover either, just because it's medically based. It's able to withstand hits from Superman. Seems like a pretty useful suit to me. Number 8. Wedding Suit A bit more of an unconventional pick for a list like this, back in 2006, during the time of the Marvel Civil War storyline, a wedding took place. A wedding between the King of Wakanda, the Black Panther, T'Challa, and the X-Men, African Princess, and some people say Goddess, Aurora Monroe. Storm. The event itself was built up for a few issues in the 2005 Black Panther storyline, and in issue number 18, it finally took place. In this event, T'Challa dons a more ceremonial panther habit, a gold necklace and a gold belt, and the classic cape. This suit doesn't serve a special function in combat outside of serving as a wedding suit, but marriage is its own kind of combat, am I right? Number 7. 
Ghost Panther. In this alternate reality called Warp World, the character T'Challa was merged with the character of the Ghost Rider, Johnny Blaze. And can I just say how insanely amazing of an idea this is? The arrogant Prince T'Challa is exiled from Wakanda and goes to America, taking up the show name Johnny Blaze. After a fatal accident, Jericho Simpson, which is a warp between Brother Voodoo and Crash Simpson, invokes the demon Zarathos, who is the half sister of the Panther Goddess Bast. T'Challa actually refuses to become the spirit of vengeance at first, but eventually he did. Now, while this isn't really a Panther habit, it is a Black Panther Ghost Rider who rides a giant flaming Panther, and um, yeah, I don't know, I'm not really seeing a downside here. Number six, Proto Habit. Oh, Deadpool, you silly, amazing character. Okay. So basically, what happens here in Black Panther vs. Deadpool number 4 is that Mr. Pool heads to Wakanda to steal a bit of vibranium to help him heal a mailman. Wade actually ends up grabbing a red ceremonial Wakandan necklace and puts it on to go and make his escape. What he did not know is that this necklace was actually a prototype panther habit. The suit analyzes his DNA, and since Black Panther has everybody's DNA on file, it remakes itself on Deadpool, adapting to his usual color scheme and the weapons he likes to use, christening himself Panther Pool. Or Dead Panther. No, Panther Pool. Panther Pool's better. It also pretty much brings him up to par with the true Black Panther, which is proven when the two get into it, until Wade's pocket-sized teleporter gets damaged, and he teleports to the Vibranium Mine, which he then teleports to right outside New Jersey. Shuri's suit. As I said before, there was a point in time when T'Challa was attacked by the forces of Doctor Doom, putting him in a coma. The one who took up the mantle of Black Panther was his sister, Princess Shuri. Along with the powers that come with consuming the heart-shaped herb, Shuri also received a panther habit. None of us should be surprised to know that Shuri herself, while being perfectly capable of hand-to-hand -hand combat, prefers using weaponry and tech. This is reflected a little bit in her habit, which is a bit more tech-savvy. Her tech and weaponry include a truncheon, capable of dishing out electric shocks, shock nets, snake bites, which are pellets used to immobilize enemies by releasing knockout gas, and desert sand, which are microscopic sand-like devices that can release an EMP. The claws on Shuri's habit were made of vibranium shells encased by adamantium, which is a little overkill, but nice. She also used to carry standard Wakandan-made spears. She now appears to have Zuri's spear of Beshenga, which belonged to the founder and first king of Wakanda. Number four. Panther battle armor. Okay, bouncing right off of that, Shuri actually dons another panther armor during the events of Doom War that I just really want to talk about. Shuri wore a battle mech armor that further amplified her strength, endurance, and durability past its already peak human levels to superhuman levels. The battle suit also had new cool weapons like this pair of vibranium powered daggers. Some versions of this armor that the Dora Milaje wore have flight capabilities with these really sweet heli drone like packs. The battle armor also has sensory arrays that made her an even more formidable adversary. Overall, just an armor that boosts the already technologically advanced superhuman to another level. Number three, Ngozi. Okay, so we've seen Ghost Panther and Panther Pool suits, but what about when the Black Panther is the host for a symbiote? A former track star who was in an accident that paralyzed her legs, Ngozi of Lagos, Nigeria eventually became bonded with the Venom symbiote. After Black Panther was killed by Rhino, who was trying to capture the symbiote, Ngozi and the symbiote instead defeated Rhino. Ngozi was recognized by the Dora Milaje, who took her to Wakanda, where she actually became the new temporary Black Panther. Ngozi herself now had the powers from the heart-shaped herb as well as the powers from the symbiote. So her habit was obviously a little different. Imagine the vibranium laced armor plus a venom symbiote suit. Why am I asking you to imagine this? It's a comic. We have pictures. Number two. Heavenly Armor. This new thrice blessed lightweight suit first appeared in Black Panther Volume 4 number 13 when he teamed up with Blade to fight vampires, which just the idea of that kind of sounds really cool. But this suit just makes it better. This suit has been consecrated in the name of the Panther God, and alongside the suit, he also wields the ebony blade of the Roman Catholic Church. This suit offers him other defenses and abilities than his regular suit. For example, it defends against attacks of a mystical nature. This panther habit also allows him to fly if he reaches the right speed. It is also incredibly badass. I just wish we got to see more of it. Number one. Wakanda Hulkbuster. Everybody knows Tony Stark has the Hulkbuster armor. Incredibly useful for taking on the Hulk if he ever loses control. But what I, and I'm sure a bunch of you didn't know, 
was that Black Panther has a Wakandan Hulkbuster. And boy, this armor is beautiful. It was created to go up against the new, totally awesome Hulk, Amadeus Cho. Unlike his Bruce counterpart, Amadeus Cho's Hulk is very in control, but everyone and their mums are afraid of what could happen. The Hulkbuster itself has sonic cannons, can fire spore clouds, and absorbs and magnifies energy. The armor eventually fails against Amadeus when he releases an EMP-like blast, rips the Buster's arm off, and rushes off to help his sister. But this armor very nearly brought him down, and all it takes is one story for it to be even more capable. Casper Cole. Before Kevin Casper Cole became the White Tiger, he was a narcotics officer. Seeking a promotion, he and a few other officers began performing unsanctioned drug busts. Casper wore a bulletproof Black Panther costume that he took from his boss, which absolutely gave him an edge. Like when he and his other officers were ambushed by a crooked cop that resulted in the other officers being put in the ICU. Casper was suspended for not wearing his vest, and he posed as the Black Panther for a time to bring down Sal and the 66 Bridges gang. Other than the usual benefits of a Panther habit, Kevin's suit sported a trench coat and many, many more pockets and pouches as he wielded actual 9mm pistols. I almost want to call it Detective Panther Suit. Number 9. Hell's Kitchen. After being ambushed by Doctor Doom, who put T'Challa in a coma, another had to take up the role of Black Panther. T'Challa lost his enhanced abilities, and after the events of Doom War, he rendered all of Wakanda's vibranium inert. So, no powers, no vibranium, and no longer the ruler of Wakanda. How about a vacation to Hell's Kitchen? After being possessed by a demonic entity, Matt Murdock, Daredevil, needed time to recover and rediscover himself away from his home, and he left the defense of Hell's Kitchen to T'Challa. Enter the Black Panther Man Without Fear story. As a now depowered street level defender, of Hell's Kitchen, T'Challa had to rely on the basics, such as his body armor, homemade gadgets, and his fighting ability. This suit doesn't really display its own usefulness. I'd say that instead, it displays the usefulness and ingenuity of T'Challa himself. Number eight, the captain. First appearing as just the captain in Captain America number 337, Steve Rogers found himself unable to merely follow orders as a simple soldier, especially after the events of the government that led to him becoming nomad. He resigned the Captain America mantle, even surrendering his shield to the new Captain America, John Walker. He took up a new adamantium based shield and, with a new uniform, he went on as a subtly different titled hero. His suit as the captain was black instead of blue, with a red and white striped chest and red gloves and boots. The suit itself did nothing. Nothing different on its own, but it allowed him to continue fighting as a hero and eventually it was passed on to John Walker when he became US agent. Hold up guys, I just want to say a quick thanks for watching. If you could toss your shields at that like and subscribe button, it would really help us out here. Also, while I have your attention, I wanted to just let you all know about Top 10 Nerd on Facebook. If you head over there, you can find more content from us. Alright, enough promotion, on to the rest of the list. Number 7, Bucky Barnes. We spoke about Sam Wilson taking up the Captain America mantle in the last video, but what about when Bucky died? on the shield back in 2005. After Steve Rogers' assassination, Bucky got Captain America's shield after defeating Black Widow and eventually confronting Tony Stark, who he held responsible. After a fight, it was decided that Bucky would be the new Captain America. Bucky outfitted himself with an alternate version of Cap's costume built by Tony Stark. The new adamantium laced uniform looked pretty good, with more of a V-shaped flag design. The costume also includes a lot of black, kind of reflecting Bucky's darker nature or even reflecting the tragic way he came into the mantle in the first place. As Cap, Bucky also wielded a pistol, which is strange to see on a Captain America, but it also makes sense for Bucky's character on the whole. Number six, Peggy. We all know who Peggy Carter is thanks to the MCU, and if you've seen the What If show, you know alternate versions of her get the super soldier serum in place of Steve Rogers. Logically, this would make her a Captain Britain, which, she is one of them as well, but a version of her appearing in Exiles number 3 in 2018 decided to become Captain America. I honestly like her Captain America costume a lot. It looks cool with the collared shirt underneath and with the shoulder straps, but it also plays to Peggy's more tactical approach. More spy on espionage vibes, I think. Plus, it's just a great concept. Number 5. Secret Avengers. When Steve Rogers became Commander Rogers of the Secret Avengers, he adopted a new suit design. It's actually very similar to and was the inspiration for the MCU Captain America Winter Soldier suit. The suit itself is more subtle, featuring a darker blue color with a silver star emblem and stripe design. It reflects the serious, darker tone of both the Secret Avengers stories and that MCU movie. In the movie, it is referred to as the stealth suit and offers more maneuverability and a more Kevlar armored design. It's also 
Chris Evans' favorite suit. It's a suit that allows Steve to step out of the role of Captain America, always doing what is expected, and instead act as himself and make the tough calls. Number four, Iron Cap. This alternate version of Cap first appears in bullet points number one. After Dr. Erskine was assassinated, the Super Soldier Serum program had to be scrapped, and Steve Rogers, still wanting to serve his country, agreed to join a program that saw him medically grafted to a giant suit of Iron Man armor. Obviously, this is different from most other normal Cap suits. This suit resembled the first few iterations of the Iron Man armor, with many of its capabilities. The suit, however, took a huge toll on Steve, who even went through rigorous stamina and strength training. He was eventually killed in the suit when he was sent on a mission to subdue the Peter Parker version of Hulk. The story, bullet points, is really interesting, serving up alternate versions of characters in interesting ways. Check it out if you have the chance. The art is also amazing. Number three, Danielle Cage. As the child of Luke Cage and Jessica Jones, Danielle Cage has a lot to live up to. In one possible future, and many others, Danielle exceeded all the expectations by taking up the mantle of Captain America. She was among the heroes who were summoned to the future to end all Father Ultron's tyrannical Reign. First appearing in US Avengers number one, Danielle herself inherited the bulletproof nature of her father, Luke Cage. So that, that's one thing that her and by extension her suit has over the usual Captain America uniform. But she also inherited the powers of her mother. She's one tough gal. Another interesting point about her is that her shield is a replica of the original Cap shield that is also a voice commanded drone. But as she always reminds her villains, she doesn't just throw the shield, she is the shield. Number two, Gladiator Cap. In the battle world, there are many lands that hold mystery and enchantment, but none as much or with as much savageness as the Green Land. First appearing in Planet Hulk number one, this version of Captain America is a fighter in the battle world Kilisseum on the outskirts of Doomstat, and he fights alongside a giant red T-Rex named Devil. That just right there is enough to sell me on this comic. But this version of Cap wields a battle axe alongside a shield that I'm assuming is not vibranium, but it takes a beating, so who knows? He also wears battle armor in true gladiator fashion with long blonde hair and no helmet. He is sent by God Emperor Doom and Sheriff Strange to go into the Green Land, which is basically inhabited by hulks and eliminate the Red King, who's a Red Hulk. It's gladiator Steve Rogers with a battle-bound T-Rex. Just do yourself a favor and check it out. Number one, Commander A or Kiyoshi Morales. When a group of five Captain Americas from different realities are brought together, we get a look at two who have not yet been seen before. But the one I wanna talk about here is Kiyoshi Morales, the great grandnephew of Luke Cage and the 25th century's Commander A. His uniform is quite unique, as is Kiyoshi himself, standing tallest and most imposing among the Captain Americas gathered by Toph Ki. Instead of a vibranium shield, Kiyoshi's suit can generate energy shields on each arm, similar in appearance to the normal Captain Americas. His suit is much more advanced as well as you'd expect from the 25th century Captain America stand-in. It features a Nero web, which allows him to tap into wireless systems and it stores information. Number 10, the Arctic Armor. First appearing in Iron Man number 318 in July of 1995, the Arctic Armor was made to withstand the harsh temperatures and conditions of the Arctic. While mainly used by Tony so he could access his secret Arctic bunker, the suit could be used in other cold weather situations, like if he had to fight an Arctic-based villain. Being in Canada, I would absolutely find a use for this suit. For example, I could use it to walk to work without the air hurting my face. Number nine, hydro armor. We know that the Iron Man armors all have some underwater capabilities. We saw it in the first Avengers movie, but the hydro armor can work at underwater depths of up to three miles down, surviving the crazy water pressure that comes with being deep in the sea. I'm gonna be honest, this couldn't be me. The ocean makes me wet my tidy whities but I guess when you've got like a tri-beam style unibeam, mini torpedoes, electrical field generators, and an octopus style black ink thingy, you are a bit more safe. At number eight is the Nomad suit. Unless you're a real Captain America fan or you just spent two days researching Captain America suits, you may not know about this one. Basically, back in 1974 in issue 180, Steve Rogers decides he's done with all the politics of being a hero and puts down the costume altogether. In its place, he decides it's time to design himself a brand new suit and go under the moniker of Nomad. 
and because of his background as a comic book artist, Steve decides to design it himself using regular materials and he gives himself a cape. Okay, for those of you who know what I'm talking about, you're probably punching your screen right now. Like, how can a costume made out of like a, a polyester blend be useful at all for Captain America? But here's the thing this suit is useful for any time that Steve Rogers needs to go under the radar or blend in with the knight. It's also got a lot better mobility than his typical suits without all that bulky armor in his way. So I would argue that throwing on the Nomad suit is probably one of Steve's best options for a truly stealthy suit that he could use for covert operations. No one would recognize him, and even if they did, they might have a harder time chasing him down with what would probably be increased mobility and camouflage in the shadows. A bit of a stretch? I don't know. Let me know what you think about that one in the comments. All right, at number seven is his Soldier Supreme suit. During the Infinity Wars storyline, Gamora captures all the souls in the universe and puts them into a soul gem, which also accidentally creates what comes to be known as Warp World. In this dimension, every soul that she captures has fused with another, creating all these beings that are inhabited by two different souls each. Not only that, but history is rewritten, including all of these beings as though they'd always existed. And that's where Soul Soldier Supreme comes in, an amalgamation of Captain America and Doctor Strange. And you betcha that this amalgamation gives us a new suit design as well, which looks a lot like what you'd expect, a Captain America and Doctor Strange hybrid. Soldier Supreme's abilities allow him to have a perfect mixture of Doctor Strange's magical powers and Captain America's leadership skills. During the Warp World version of World War II, we see Cap healing downed comrades, while also leading them into battle, making what becomes one of the most powerful and useful iterations of Captain America out there. The only reason why I don't put this one at number one is because it could be argued that it isn't the suit giving him these powers but Gamora's spell. But his suit does appear entirely different when he's transformed and that's, eh, that's enough to squeeze it on this list. Okay, at number six, we have the Commander America suit worn by a descendant of the original Captain America, Steve Rogers V. This suit appears in an issue of What If? that poses the question, what if Cap and the rest of the team went up against the Guardians of the Galaxy? This suit has five generations of work done on it, giving it some added features that make the suit much more useful than the original. One of which is the space helmet attachment that allows the user to travel in space. This is a useful development considering that there are some major events in the Marvel Universe that take place in the expanse of the cosmos, as well as on other planets with different atmospheres. In a hypothetical situation where Steve Rogers has a closet full of all the suits on this list, past and future, this suit would probably get taken out more often than you might think for any conflicts that take the team into the void. It's also got some cool chrome shoulder pads as well for when he gets hit in the, in the shoulder. Okay, fine, it's mostly about the helmet. Okay, at number five is the Paradise X suit, which is barely a suit at all. It's more of a single American flag wrapped around the naked body of a godlike Captain America. In this storyline, Captain America has died along with other superpowered beings we know, and they are living, or rather, existing in a celestial realm called Paradise X. And instead of the Avengers, they're called the Avenging Hosts. It's pretty out there, but basically, Captain America is a ghost-type entity with mystical powers in this storyline, and he is able to fly. He's also able to shapeshift and tap into the memories of the other entities in this Paradise X realm. So, yeah, that's all well and good that he's super powerful, you say, but how is his suit useful? Well, this one may be arguably one of the most useful suits on the list, considering it's the only thing that's preventing us all from witnessing this supernatural Cap's celestial parts. I I'm serious. That's the genuine reason why this suit takes a spot on this list. Sure, I could argue that it supports his supernatural abilities, but we all know it's just a cloth a very useful cloth that protects this comic book series from an X rating. Useful? I'd say so. Bit of a stretch? Maybe. I thought it was funny. At number four, we have the 2099 suit developed by Alchemax. On Earth 23291, the Captain America identity belongs to a woman named Roberta Mendez. And in this reality, the Captain America suit is extremely powerful with a few new capabilities that make this suit stand out hugely from the rest. The two main features that really give this suit the edge are the energy wings and the energy sword that the suit is equipped with. Considering Roberta also has the super soldier serum coursing through her veins, everything that comes with the suit is an automatic plus. In the very start of the first issue of Secret Wars 2099, 
We see a bounty hunter trying to take a shot at Roberta, but is totally overpowered by this new flying ability of hers. And there's no question that anyone wearing the suit can call on these abilities, making these new powers not exclusive to the wearer of the suit, but of the suit itself. So with the types of threats coming at this reality's Avengers, they know that their leader will have no problem in both offensive and defensive stats. This definitely beats out a lot of the other armors worn by any Captain America across all realities. The superhero just isn't often seemed equipped with much other than a shield and maybe a sidearm, so energy weapons? Definitely a huge advantage for any Captain America as far as I'm concerned. Alright, at number 3 is the Hydra Supreme Suit. In an alternate reality during the comic book event Secret Empire, Captain America is actually a bad guy, taking on the look of a darker, more brutal soldier than his original self. His shield has a more pointed, angular design to it like that of a medieval knight, and the suit brings much more power to the one who wears it. This suit, when paired with the cosmic cube fragments, allows for the user to take control over Mjolnir, Thor's hammer. This on its own is enough of a point for this suit to score high on this list, but there's more. This suit also helps Captain America change the course of reality. Yes, this is sort of the cosmic cube doing this, but when paired with the armor, the wearer is also almost entirely impervious to harm. So I'm going to argue that it's fair in this case. While wearing this suit, this evil version of Captain America actually strategizes successfully enough to take over Washington DC and eventually all of the United States to try and instill his own order. Although his intentions are not by any means pure in this reality, this suit is undoubtedly one of the most powerful that any version of Steve Rogers wears, and for that reason, it deserves a spot on the list. At number two is one you most likely have heard of before, but it needed to make it on the list just because of how insanely useful it is compared to the original suit, and that is the Sam Wilson Falcon uniform. This suit is given to Sam Wilson when Steve Rogers wanes off of the super soldier serum and gives up the mantle of Captain America, and it is a huge upgrade. Taking on the abilities of Falcon and Captain America at once, this suit allows for flight and rocket and machine gun fire out of the wings. On top of this, we see how strong these wings can be when used to shield Wilson in battle. This gives the suit the added bonus of a nearly indestructible full body shield made of vibranium on top of the iconic handheld shield passed down with the Captain America mantle. The shield can also clip into a holster on his back, giving him protection from behind when he doesn't see it coming. This suit is such a major upgrade from the original and could probably be maneuvered by anyone who puts it on, giving it sophistication. So there's no arguing that this suit on its own could be pretty useful to anyone with fighting and piloting skills. And it's probably one of the closest things that Captain America has to an Iron Man suit, other than our number one which is the exoskeleton suit. This is an extremely useful suit for Captain America given the circumstances he finds himself in in issue 437. Sometime in the future, Captain America has been rendered completely paralyzed after contracting an illness from the super soldier serum. So none other than Tony Stark designs him a suit that, much like the Iron Man suit, can actually get him up and walking around again. And fighting around again, and in arguably an even more effective capacity than ever before. The suit is designed to offer extreme protection due to the sophisticated armor and some other nifty effects as well, like beams that he can shoot out of his palms that cause severe cases of vertigo and magnetic gloves and missile protection that offered Cap a lot of good defense against serious threats. Yeah, they're not the most destructive features, but this is actually intentional. Tony Stark decides to keep the suit entirely non-lethal to keep Steve Rogers' values in line, allowing him to face evil without stooping to their level. So not only is this suit useful to compensate for and basically cure his paralysis, but it's also arguably a really great suit to return to if he's ever facing an offensive threat that might require heavy armor. He can also call all on the armor to attach to him within seconds because he was, you know, totally paralyzed. But this is also a feature that's basically unprecedented for Captain America and would be useful with or without the plight of full body paralysis. At number 10 is the Yeoman America armor. This costume is introduced in Avengers Volume 3 issue number 2 when Morgan Le Fay uses a reality distortion wave, which turns all the Avengers into medieval versions of themselves. And Steve Rogers' look totally changes as well with his armor resembling that of a medieval knight. What gives this suit a spot on the list is the fact that it comes with a sword. And considering how powerful Captain America is without a weapon, just imagine what he can do wielding a sword. Now, there are
There are downfalls to the suit as well. Like it appears as though it has reduced mobility due to the loincloth thing, the crude knee pads, and the hood. And one might argue that since it's a medieval costume, the shield would be made of a traditional steel or iron instead of vibranium or other reinforced metals. But still, this is a list about useful suits and there's no doubt a sword definitely has its uses. At number 9 is the original Howard Stark redesigned suit. Okay, fine, you've probably heard of this one, but it's pretty dang useful, so it deserves a spot. Firstly, it's the first time he's given his round shield with the star and stripes, and it's made of, as Howard puts it, all of the vibranium they had at the time of its creation. This means that this suit marks the first time that Steve Rogers has all the freedom he wants to use his shield as a weapon without any recoil from his blows. The suit is also made with carbon polymer flame resistant materials, a bulletproof helmet, and a utility belt with a gun holster on it. And we all know that in the comics, Captain America doesn't typically have a gun. So this is a huge plus for this suit. This makes this suit a great choice to take out of the closet if ever Captain America is faced with a mission where he might come under fire and have to return some himself. Pretty handy if you ask me. Number 8. Rescue Armor Thanks to the MCU, many people probably know that Pepper Potts has an Iron Man like suit. Donning her armor, she becomes the hero Rescue. The armor was secretly designed by Tony for use by Pepper. The suit isn't really built for offense. Its specialties are more emergency search and rescue. The original thrusters don't even create heat, but it does have repulsors and finger lasers. The suit can fly and gives Pepper super speed and strength. It also lets her manipulate magnetic fields. The armor also is capable of generating force fields that are strong enough to catch airplanes, as an example. It generally remains the same in all its iterations, being used primarily for defense, except the MCU suit, which was clearly very offensive. Like, as in it could fight, not that it was offending people. Offensive. You get it. Number 7. Bleeding Edge Armor so the Bleeding Edge armor is a lot like the armor we see in the Infinity War and Endgame movies, meaning it's almost like a liquid armor. It's actually made of microbots, but hey, tomato tomato. The bots can take the form of clothes, other armors, or even beings upon Tony's skin. As well as that, the suit can form a bunch of different weapons. The part about this suit that I think makes it ultimately the most useful is its RT node. This powers both the suit and Tony's transhuman body. It grants him a crazy augmented intelligence and superhuman multitasking and learning abilities. Meaning it makes a super genius even more super genius C. Number 6. Ice Armor This armor, more than anything, shows the vast range of Tony Stark's mind. The ice armor came to be when Tony Stark was sent back in time to 1 million BC. Tony had to make this suit out of whatever materials he had around. So at the time, it was a limited amount of vibranium that he turned into batteries and circuitry of his ruined modern armor. The suit defensively was kind of impressive, considering it was able to hold up against a fight with Mephisto even if it got damaged. The weapon systems were super low tech, like so low tech it fired icicles. I'm sure this was pretty high tech though for 1 million BC. Number 5. Iron Destroyer Armor During the Fear Itself storyline, the god Odin let Tony Stark have access to the forges of Nidavellir to create weapons to counter the serpent and his forces. Tony created a whole bunch of Uru metal weapons for himself and a group of other heroes. Tony merged the systems of his bleeding edge armor with the Uru metal, turning it into the Iron Destroyer. When Odin left back to Asgard at the end of the fight, the powers of the Uru weapons and the Iron Destroyer armor disappeared. So Tony removed the Uru from the suit and gave it back to the forges along with the rest of the weapons to be melted down and reforged into something else. This armor as well as the other Uru weapons created were so sweet. If he could have kept it, the armor would have been extremely useful against so many different threats. Number 4. Renaissance Armor The Renaissance Armor first appeared in Iron Man Volume 3, Number 1, and was created to be a safe. The Renaissance Armor first appeared in Iron Man Volume 3, Number 1, and was created to be a safe armor. Safe from exposure to other suits' power systems that were causing health problems. So, yeah. 
Just based on that, it's already much, much more useful. It had a sonic ramshot weapon in addition to normal sonic weapons, repulsors, pulse bolts, and a unibeam. It had tear gas pellets and a fire extinguishing foam in the left gauntlet. It also had a really cool hamster ball force field bubble thing to protect civilians. It almost seems like it would be a really good like riot suit or something like that. Hey y'all, let me stop you for a little word from our sponsors. It's you. Thanks to all your support, we're able to keep bringing you these videos. So thanks a lot. And don't forget to shoot your repulsors at that like button. Okay, on to the top three. Number three, the Phoenix Killer Armor. The Model 38, or the Phoenix Killer Armor, first appeared in Avengers vs. X-Men number five, and was created to counteract the Phoenix. Obviously. So the armor's main purpose was to kill the Phoenix Force. And if you don't know, the Phoenix Force is one of the oldest cosmic entities in the Marvel Universe. It's basically the manifestation of the force of life. It's one of the most powerful and feared entities in the Marvel landscape. And Tony was like, I can kill this with lasers. No. No you can't. But what you did do, Tony, was split it in five, which resulted in five mutants, Cyclops, Emma Frost, Namor, Colossus, and Magic becoming avatars to the Phoenix Force. Congratulations, you played yourself. Number two, Model 53. The Iron Man armor Model 53 was made after Tony's normal armor failed to stop an evil clone of Squirrel Girl. So I'm calling this a Squirrel Girl Buster armor and you can't stop me, okay? Cool. It was made for the single purpose of countering the abilities of Squirrel Girl. It's got a super cute squirrel head, which has a backup of that uh, aforementioned RT node. It's got repulsors, obviously, but they're strong enough to even knock out Black Panther. And it sort of looks like a Hulkbuster armor, which is interesting. When the evil clone defeats all the other Avengers that Iron Man had assembled, the clone uses their weapons to defeat this suit. But if she didn't have that, Iron Man would probably have been able to take the win here. Probably. Number one, Model 60. This armor is very interesting. You see, its main ability was to be able to switch into its transportation mode, which was, wait for it, a Vespa. A Vespa that Tony used to go on a date with Janet Van Dyne, the Wasp. Get it? Because Vespa is Italian for Wasp. Very slick, Tony. Very slick indeed. The Vespa, plus the helmet Tony wears, can form into an Iron Man suit, which it did when the two were attacked by robots sent by Banetronics. It does all the same things an Iron Man suit does, plus it has a cool energy sword. But it turns into a Vespa, which is the best part about this useful armor. Number 10, Stealth Armor. Yes, Iron Man has a stealth suit. Are you surprised? You're gonna say no, right? Right? There are many iterations of this suit, but just for the sake of this video and my sanity, we are only gonna cover the first one. This appeared in Iron Man 152 when Tony used the suit to infiltrate the Heaven's Hand Fortress. Now, the armor itself prioritizes stealth over everything else, meaning it isn't really meant for combat. But to make up for that, the suit has a radar absorbing coating, ECM jamming, and a plasma force field thingy to distort radar and sonar. It had stealthy flight capabilities, and eventually it also had camouflage. Later iterations were much more advanced, but this is probably one of the more useful suits for many different circumstances. Nine, Endosim armor. I saw some of you guys suggest this one, so I wanted to give it a spot. The Endosim armor is a super slick and capable version of the Iron Man armor. A lot of you have probably heard of it, but whatever. This armor first fully debuted in the Superior Iron Man story when Tony's moral axis was switched. The suit is based off of symbiote biology, meaning the process of the liquid metal suiting up is completely psionic. It's basically almost alive, not having its own intelligence, but can form into an armor without the user inside of it to command it. Tony can even send the suit out onto another person to protect or trap them. The repulsors are uber powerful. It has rocket boosted punches, can absorb electromagnetic energy, and it's not weak to sonic attacks like most symbiotes. It's also super stylish. Number eight, high gravity armor. I like this one. Even if its design is goofy, it's something I think would actually need to be taken into account. This suit, was made to help its wearer withstand the increased gravity conditions of hyperspace travel, helping the body keep blood in the limbs, not just the torso, and those huge feet helped with moving around. The suit helped Tony withstand 50 Gs, 
but his actual limits haven't really been explicitly mentioned. It didn't stop Tony from passing out from G-Lock though, and it definitely didn't stop him from puking, but it cleaned him up and disinfected him. Just like a good friend after a party. Number seven, cold iron armor. Everything in the War of the Realms related stories is just so metal. The cold iron armor first appeared in Iron Man Volume 5, number 24, back in 2014, and came to be when Tony was on a stealth mission in the dark elf homeworld of Svartalfheim. The armor itself is actually worn over top of another suit, and it's completely made of iron. Iron is actually a metal that is lethal for dark elves, so it's kind of weird that Iron Man wasn't the first one called, but this is actually an iron Iron Man armor. Like, actually, actually iron. Its weapons include a fireable iron hook, a cloud of iron nails, and these super sweet iron claws on each arm. Just look at this thing. Number six, God Killer Armor Mark II. Bet you didn't know that Tony Stark had a celestial sized suit of armor powered by eight nuclear reactors that is just casually orbiting Mars. Or, I guess if you read Avengers Volume 8, number 5, you would. This armor entered the fray when the Dark Celestials attacked the Earth and battled alongside giant versions of She-Hulk, Thor, and Ghost Rider. While there are other versions of the Godkiller armor, this one is my favorite. And the fact that it was kept orbiting Mars just in case really feels like something Tony Stark would do. Number five, deep space armor. This is probably the one armor on this list that most people have heard of. This suit was created when Tony Stark took a vacation from Earth and went out into space with the Guardians of the Galaxy. The suit can use an autopilot in emergencies and even allows Tony to control suits hundreds of light years away back on Earth. It's a modular suit too, allowing for things like enhanced back thrusters and wrist mounted explosive launchers. It even has an extension that allows for lunar landings. It can travel at warp and sub-warp speeds, which is useful for space travel. Just overall for space travel, this suit is the most useful of all the Iron Man armors. Four, the ablative armor. This armor was pretty unique. It consisted of tons and tons of little honeycomb shaped tiles that are all held together by a force field. The idea was that the tiles would break on impact, better absorbing impacts that a solid piece of armor was less useful for. Anytime a tile would be destroyed or fall out of the force field, it would be replaced by another tile which is good for a suit of armor. These tiles could even separate from the armor itself and be used as projectiles or as countermeasures. Overall, it's just an armor with so many unique and useful capabilities, and I hope we see more of it. Hey, you nerds. Before we get onto the top three, I just wanted to say a quick thanks for watching. I hope you're enjoying the video. If you are, why not hit us with a like and maybe subscribe? It really helps us out to continue giving you videos. All right, moving on. Number three, the Nano Iron Man armor. Now this is a bit less of a traditional armor. When battling Fin Fang Foom, Tony initially used the giant Fin Fang Foom buster armor, but when that failed, he instead shot a pod of thousands of nano Iron Man armor microbots into the dragon thingy's blood. The bots were then remotely operated to investigate Fing Fang Foom and then fight his antibodies and travel to his brainstem, where the armors were used to destroy the control disc. Nanobots are a technology we're trying to develop in the real world to solve thousands of problems, mainly medical in nature. So this is an extremely, extremely useful armor. Number two, Thor Buster armor. Now most people know about the famous Hulk Buster suit thanks to the MCU, and just because it's awesome. But did you know Tony has made a Thor Buster armor as well? There are actually a few Asgardian based Iron Man armors and they are all extremely awesome and useful. But to me, an armor to counteract the God of Thunder directly seems the coolest. He used the armor to go toe to toe with the God of Thunder, who is already massively powerful. But Thor was actually boosted up by the power of the Odin Force at the time. The armor was able to manipulate Asgardian energies like the Odin Force, which served Tony well. He was even capable of stopping Mjolnir mid-fight. Unfortunately, Thor destroyed the suit's reactor, forcing Tony to eject. But if this armor could trade punches with Odin Force Thor, it would be extremely useful facing any Asgardian related threat. Number one, the virtual armor. This suit is probably the most unique of all of Tony Stark's armors. It's also the most recent suit on this list. The virtual suit first debuted in Iron Man 2020, volume two, number five when Tony Stark had his consciousness pulled out of his body to save his life, and it resulted in the virtual armor, which was made from the resources of the 13th floor, which is basically a virtual reality 
built of solid light. Look, it's it's hard to explain, okay? The virtual armor could allow Tony to create any weapon he can think of. It augmented his strength, it protects against weapons fire, and it's invisible by default, acting as almost a force field around Tony. It can separate to form a prison-like bubble. The suit even somehow still allows him to fly and protects him from the vacuum of space. I have no idea how it works. Like, at all. And it's the most comic booky thing I've ever heard of, but it's almost limitless possible capabilities easily make it the most useful Iron Man suit. Number 10, The Long Halloween. The bat suit from The Long Halloween has become almost as iconic and well-loved as the story in which it appears. In The Long Halloween, we get to truly see Batman shine as a brilliant detective, which is a huge part of his character and what fans love about him. The Long Halloween suit is fairly powerful as it comes with Batman's iconic yellow utility belt, but the overall color scheme for it is a touch darker than usual, making it even more appropriate for stealthing around in the dark. Something that you likely want a bat suit to be really well designed for, considering how much it's a part of Batman's general strategy for disarming and taking down criminals. Starting off light, I give the Long Halloween one pouch out of five for my personal Beltometer ranking, which I'm gonna do throughout this list just because I think it's funny and I want to. Number nine, Earth One. On Earth One, Batman's suit can plug into a state-of-the-art advanced computer system that he keeps in his Batcave. This system allows him to run criminal checks and also process criminal analysis. Within his utility belt, he also has a plethora of tools and devices to be used in the field. The Earth-1 suit provides Batman with all the items that he needs to unleash the full potential of his investigative skills and helps to enhance Batman's already impressive fighting prowess. It's a standard suit, but one that gets the job done and works well. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. I give the Earth-1 suit two out of five utility belt pouches. And friends, before we move on to this next spot, if you are loving this list and you want more lists like it where we talk about all the various bat suits. Number eight. The Canadian Spider Suit. In an alternate reality, first seen in Cosmic Ghost Rider Destroys Marvel History, Volume 1, Number 6, Ben Riley wore a suit that differs a little bit from its blue and red counterpart. This suit had a black and red color scheme. The aesthetic webbing looked very suspiciously like plaid. It had brown leather gloves and boots, and the chest spider symbol was inside of a pinkish white maple leaf like shape. I can't possibly tell what they were going for here. Oh, you know what? I think. Yeah, it's a Canadian Spider-Man. Other than the aesthetic, Canadian Spider Ben Riley is exactly the same as his 616 counterpart, but way more apologetic and probably slightly more resistant to cold weather. Number seven, Threats and Menaces suit. TNM, or Threats and Menaces, is a news website in New York City. And after a long time of being unemployed, Peter Parker accepts a job there. They give him a new suit that can record his perspective as Spider-Man and broadcast it live, giving viewers a first-person view of Spidey's battles, essentially turning Spider-Man into a streamer. It 100% defeats the purpose of being a hero, and if he wasn't doing it because he had no job at the time, I think it was kind of sleazy. But it's also kind of really awesome. Like, I definitely watched that. The suit also got a new, really cool white, blue, and yellow color scheme and enhanced his strength and speed. If that wasn't enough though, the suit also has holographic abilities and every few minutes includes a word from TNM's sponsors. Number six, Spider-Man Earth 71928. On Earth 71928, Peter's life remained pretty much the same as Earth 616 Peter until Uncle Ben died, and Peter killed the robber who shot him. In a very Punisher-like decision, Peter decided to deal with crime by any means, meaning he killed criminals. Peter tried to avoid this at first, but since criminals be criminals, and that life is kind of hard to leave behind, they always came back, and gosh darn it, Peter was not okay with that. Yeah. A great reason to be a murderer, man. He carried the pistol that took Uncle Ben's life as well as other weaponry with multiple different types of ammunition. His suit also took a skull logo instead of the traditional spider logo due to the spider that gave him his powers being a noble false widow, which has a cephalothorax that looks like a skull. Yeah, okay Marvel. You know, I'm seeing a lot of Punisher parallels here. Hmm, strange. Number five, upgraded advanced suit. The advanced Spider-Man suit in the Marvel Spider-Man video game always deserves a mention, but it's literally on the cover of the game. 
So another armor native to that game though comes to mind. That's the upgraded advanced suit. Peter creates this armor out of the same material that Dr. Otto Octavius created his cybernetic limbs with. While he originally made this suit as a side project, it became extremely useful when Doc Ock became his sinister self. The suit allowed Peter to be able to actually stand up to his old mentor and it looked really good doing it. All black metal like material with the yellow eyes and the spider symbol. After I beat the game I definitely use this as my main suit and you know what? It's actually worn on top of the advanced suit so I'm kind of hitting two spiders with one stone here. Number 4. Spider-Man Carnage Doppelganger We all know Spider-Man had the awesome black venom symbiote suit but did you know Miles Morales had one too? When he was forcibly bonded with a symbiote by Carnage, the resulting suit is a corrupted looking version of Miles' already awesome suit with a jaw, splashes and spirals, and ripped gloves and boots. It also changed colors when in a fight. Just like Peter, Miles eventually got control of the suit, changing its look with red streaks under the eyes. Also, the spider logo was skinny and the legs extended and wrapped around the shoulders and thighs. This suit was both useful and detrimental. All the perks of having a symbiote bonded suit, but also with all the cons. It didn't last as long as Peter's run with a symbiotic suit though, which sucks when you know how much better it looks. Don't kill me in the comments for that. Hold up. Hey, before we carry on, I just want to say thanks. Thanks for being you. Thanks for watching. Thanks for hitting that like button. And if you did it, thanks for subscribing. It means a lot to us here. Okay, now let's carry on before I get too sentimental. Number three, the black cloth suit. After Peter Parker defeated Venom and removed the symbiotic suit, his girlfriend at the time, Black Cat, gave him this black cloth Spider-Man suit that was thankfully not a symbiote. Her reasoning was that, well, to put it plainly, she thought he looked sexier in the black suit. Hey, we all know black is sexy, okay? He was initially resistant to the idea, but he had to wear it because his other suit shrunk in the wash. Yes, that's the actual reason. Peter Parker problems, am I right? Really, it was because fans loved the black suit. I am one of those fans. The black suit and his traditional suit were swapped in and out from time to time, and the black suit was even his primary suit for a while when the other one was destroyed. This suit was useful for Peter as his girlfriend loved it and fans loved it. Oh, and it was uh, really good for stealth and intimidated the hell out of bad guys. Yeah. Number two, fear itself suit. If you don't know about the fear itself story, well, change that please. It's an awesome story. Basically, the brother of Odin, who is evil, returns and sends these magical Mjolnir-like hammers to Earth that corrupt heroes and turn them into his chosen. That's a ton of power, and the heroes really struggle to quell that threat. Tony Stark and the dwarves of Nidavellir team up to create Uru armor and weapons for a bunch of heroes. Spider-Man was one of those heroes. The suit had two gauntlets on each wrist, which were equipped with blades on each arm which could be used as melee weapons. It also changed the color scheme to a neon-like blue and white scheme. It was really sweet looking. Unfortunately, we don't really know the full capabilities of the suit as Odin ordered it and the other Uru weapons to be destroyed after the conflict. But it had to be extremely useful against the Asgardian level threats because they won. Number one, Superior Spider-Man suit. Fans of the character will know that the Superior Spider-Man is actually Dr. Otto Octavius. <gasps> who switched bodies with Peter Parker. After Peter died in Otto's body, and Otto was shown the experiences and memories of Peter, he decided to become an even better Spider-Man. Part of that process included creating a new suit. The modifications to the suit weren't just aesthetic. Otto added a heads-up display on the lenses, all of the fingers on the gloves have retractable claws on them, and the big toe on both boots is separated from the rest of the boot and both have retractable talons, which is kind of weird. He also added carbonadium in the mask to prevent mind switching. He added a built-in communications device to activate nano spider tracers and created spider arms on the back. When Peter came back, surprise, he used the suit with energy weapons and extra arms in order to defeat Itsy Bitsy. Yes, that's a villain. This suit was much more advanced and also looked pretty awesome. Number 10, Spider-Man Noir. This one is coming in at number 10 because people in the comments will tell me it's very well known. Yeah, I know, but it's awesome. So, I don't know, deal with it. On Earth 90214, Peter Parker modeled his spider suit after his Uncle Ben's World War I air pilot uniform. But I mean, no. He modeled it after being totally awesome. With that trench coat and the fedora hat, the goggles, the vest. He even carries a pistol. He used what he had in the 1930s to create a spider detective. You love it, I love it, 
We all love it. And it always deserves to be talked about when we talk about Spider-Man suits. Always. Number nine, the Bombastic Bagman. If you don't know about this suit, you're welcome. It has appeared twice. Both times are equally hilarious. The first time it ever appeared was when Peter removed the symbiote costume with the help of Reed Richards and Johnny Storm and had no choice but to put on an extra Fantastic Four costume. But those costumes don't have masks. So what did he do? Make a new one, I hear you say? <sighs> don't be silly. No, no, no. Johnny poked eye holes in a paper bag and put it on Peter's head. But that's not all. Oh, no, no. It seems as though someone placed a kick me sign on the back of the costume too as if it wasn't all embarrassing enough. Adam, how is this useful? Because it's hilarious. Oh, and uh, it's a really great last minute costume idea to keep his identity secret. Yeah, that's why. Okay, number eight goes to the SP slash slash DR suit. Kind of says spider in a fun way. This suit is featured in the hit animated movie, Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, but was first introduced in the comic event of the same name. The suit is controlled by Penny Parker, who's taking over for her late father, who used to man the suit. What's interesting about this armor is that it's partly controlled by a living radioactive spider that lives within it. And to use the suit, Penny has to get bitten by the spider, which she dutifully does. The suit is massive, offering tons of protection, and it shoots extra durable webs out of its integrated web shooters. And a suit that's mechanized and able to shoot webs even stronger than those of the original Spider-Man comes in handy when facing off against bad guys like Penny's universe's Mysterio. In a big face-off, the suit proves useful when Penny is able to avoid the effects of a nauseous gas emitted by Mysterio. So, it seems like the suit also offers some pretty effective filtration. Not the most versatile suit, but an interesting one that might come in pretty handy in certain situations. At number seven, it's the stealth suit, also known by fans as the big time costume. After facing off against the new Hobgoblin and the amazing Spider-Man number 649 and 650, Peter goes back to Horizon Labs where he'd been working a day job and designs the suit to be better well, suited for the fight. This costume is extremely useful in that it's got a few different settings for different matchups. In camo mode, the suit turns green and keeps him invisible both visually and audibly to anyone who he doesn't want seeing him. This means that through certain lenses held by his allies, the green outlines can be seen so they know where he is in battle. The other mode is called anti-sound mode, which turns the suit red, and it cancels out all sonic-based attacks like the new Hobgoblin supersonic attacks. This the suit also has anti-metal spiders that can shoot out the top of his wrists that will eat away at and dissolve metal. And the suit can also repair any tears in the fabric at the command of the wearer's thoughts. At number six, we've got Spidey's Future Foundation costume. This suit is designed by the Future Foundation, which is kind of like the revised Fantastic Four, and it has a really cool black and white finish but that's not what this list is about. The suit is also extremely handy and implements some pretty futuristic technology known as third generation unstable molecules. This technology allows Peter Parker to switch from the black and white look to the classic red and blue, or even his civilian clothes in an instant with just a thought. The suit also can't get dirty due to the unstable molecules, which is pretty cool. But the most useful part of this suit is probably its stealth capabilities, which allows Spidey to go almost completely invisible. This feature is particularly useful when he needs to swing around at night without being seen. It's just a great suit that helps Peter Parker's already formidable powers to shine even more. And it's just one of the coolest looking ones, in my opinion. Okay, number five, we've got the Spider-Man 2099 suit. This spider suit has a cape, yes. It's kind of small, but it's a freaking cape. First worn by Miguel O'Hara in Spider-Man 2099 number one, this suit was originally designed for Miguel to wear at a Day of the Dead celebration. Yes, this suit was meant for partying, but very soon became much more than that with an upgraded version actually incorporating jet boots. I think this is such a cool addition to a Spider-Man suit because it makes a lot of sense to enhance his swinging capabilities. It's also got GPS sensors, allowing the wearer to navigate around the city effortlessly. Sadly, in the newer iteration of the suit, the cape was scrapped, but in its place are these tiny web wings that allow the wearer to glide a bit more in the air. This suit is just a lot of fun and would be very useful for day-to-day -day crime fighting around the city because it allows this Spider-Man to reach new speeds in the air and I would imagine longer times between web swings. 
It also just looks really cool again. Okay, fine, they all look cool, but I just have to say it still. Okay, at number four, we've got the Iron Spider armor created by Tony Stark. In many realities, Peter Parker either turns down this suit or retires it quickly for various reasons, but thankfully, he does make use of it a few times. We've all had the pleasure of seeing how this suit looks in all its 4K MCU glory, but what's really great about this suit is what it can do. Firstly, the most notable feature, visually speaking, are the mechanical spider arms, which are actually called Waldos for some reason. These arms actually have cameras on the tips of them to peer around corners and small grippers built to the end of the tips so they could act as extra arms for climbing and getting around. The suit can glide as well, allowing Spider-Man to move around a bit in the air and underwater because the suit also has a state-of-the-art mask filter that allows for nuclear, biological, and chemical filtration, as well as eight minutes of clean oxygen if the wearer needed to explore something underwater. There are so many more things to cover as well. This suit is basically just as protective as the classic Iron Man suit, and with all these extra abilities, it just adds so much more power to Peter Parker's already impressive abilities. All right, at number three, we've got Spider Armor Mark III, otherwise known as the Ends of the Earth suit. This suit is created in Horizon Labs by Peter Parker Parker as a last resort to help take down the Sinister Six. But I guess Peter works well under pressure because this suit is insane. Starting with the helmet, it has super hearing capabilities designed to pick up on Chameleon's heartbeat. The helmet could also communicate with Spider-Man's fellow teammates in battle with a calm link system. It also has a holographic sensor allowing the wearer to see through Mysterio's holograms and illusions, and it's capable of repelling Electro entirely, turning him back into human form on command, which is pretty cool. The suit allows for Spider-Man to fly with jet boosters and enhances web shooters that allow the user to fire more webs than the typical suits. Not only that, but the utility belt on the suit carries multiple cartridges of different types of webbing. Also spider tracers and ice spiders. And listen, I'm leaving out a few things for time's sake too. Listen, the only reason why this suit doesn't take number one is because its abilities were catered pretty specifically to the feat of taking down the Sinister Six. So in other cases, it might not be quite as effective as it is facing off in this specific scenario, but that's only one small fault for a very useful suit. Pretty nuts. At number two, we're graduating from the term useful and veering more into absolutely overpowered with Spider-Man's Captain Universe suit. All right, fine, this isn't really a suit per se. Like, it's not something any old Peter Parker could slip on and off, but it's still a suit and it's still extremely useful. This suit was created when Spider-Man was involved in a lab accident, but unlike the radioactive spider situation, this time he's actually given what's called the uni power, making him one of the most powerful Spider-Man characters we've ever come across. He's got Univision, which endows him with a sort of cosmic consciousness, allowing him to sense things not just coming at him in the macro world, but he can sense things on a subatomic level, bringing the Spidey senses to a whole new meaning. This power also allows him to get people to tell the truth, which is pretty handy, I'd say. In Captain Universe form, Spider-Man can also manipulate energy, allowing him to fly. And above all this, the actual suit allows Spider-Man to withstand extremes in temperatures, allowing the wearer to traverse basically any environment on Earth and possibly beyond. He also has enough strength to punch the Hulk into orbit. And yes, it may be arguable that this isn't the suit allowing for this kind of power, but the suit and the powers kind of come together in this instance, so it remains on the list. Okay, at number one, it is the Amazing Spider-Man suit or Spider Armor Mark IV. Okay, here we go. This suit can detect magic, infrared and x-ray beams, scan injured people to determine their injuries, and even detect plasma levels in blood to help administer first aid on a superhuman level. And in this iteration of the spider armor, the different webbing is available not by switching out cartridges on a waistband, but by voice command. So the wearer just has to say the word and the web shooter will go from shooting regular webs to electrified webs, to concrete webbing, which is a web with such strong durability that it was able to stop an Aztec god in its tracks. The suit also has an array of defensive capabilities like administering antidotes if the wearer comes into contact with poison, as well as stealth and camo abilities as well. I'm missing so much just to keep this one short, but it's fair to say that this suit is the most widely useful as of posting this video, and I just can't wait to see what comes with the Spider Armor Mark V, which starts our list at number two. 
10 with Spider-Man's bulletproof suit or Spider Armor Mark II. This suit is designed when Peter Parker loses his spider senses, which we all know would make him much more susceptible to bullets specifically. So instead of taking a break and hiding away for a while or being too heroic and going out and getting shot, Peter just creates a new and improved spider armor to face off against Massacre, a mass murderer. Massacre had captured a bunch of hostages, but when Spidey swoops in, he makes easy work of the killer by easily deflecting his bullets. The suit's magnetic webbing also interferes with the villain's ability to remotely activate traps, which I'm not sure was planned or not, but hey, the suit comes through again for Spider-Man in that way too. This suit was very useful for this very specific situation, but sits back on the list just because there are simply much better suits coming up. Okay, at number nine, we've got Spider-Man's Electro-Proof suit. This suit was created in Amazing Spider-Man number 425 in an effort to get a one-up on Electro, a villain who we all know has electric powers. The reason why Peter Parker hadn't come up with this idea before is that it just didn't seem necessary as Spider-Man could usually find ways to outmatch Electro, but this time Electro had found a way to supercharge himself and become even more powerful than ever before. So Spider-Man decides to design a brand new suit which also just looks really cool. Although it was first presented in the comics, the suit can also be used in 2014's The Amazing Spider-Man 2 video game for PS4. Number 8, Exoframe. The Dark Knight Returns bat suit, known sometimes as the Exoframe bat suit or the Powered bat suit from Frank Miller's story featuring an old Batman facing off against an old but less aged Superman, is a tank of a suit. I mean it has to be because it has to help compensate for Batman's more advanced age, and it also has to make up for the power imbalance between Bruce and Clark so that he doesn't just get smooshed straight out of the gate, but can actually hold his own against the powerhouse that is Superman. This is a much more armor-based and durable suit. It also comes fully weaponized with some tricks that Batman can utilize to help him in his fight against Superman. Ultimately, the suit isn't enough to let him win the battle, unless, of course, his whole plan was to just put up a good show and feign defeat in the end, which based on the ending of this story seems extremely likely. I give The Dark Knight Returns Batsuit two pouches out of five. Number seven, Plated. The plated bat suit comes from Christopher Nolan's Dark Knight trilogy and is the new suit that Bruce has made after the Nomex suit leaves him wanting more flexibility. Batman can't turn his head in this suit, which of course means he has to rely on peripherals in combat and, he jokes, makes it hard for him to back out of the driveway. Lucius Fox, in response to Bruce's complaints on the Nomex suit, helps him by designing the plated suit. This suit is composed of more separate pieces, which give Batman added flexibility flexibility, agility, and speed. It's made up of hardened Kevlar plates on a titanium-dipped fiber, with his cowl's new design being based on that of a motorcycle helmet, granting him increased flexibility in his neck so he can actually, you know, turn his head. Batman also gives the suit sonar vision, which would use cell phones to help Batman see and even pitch darkness by tapping into said cell phones and using them as microphones to broadcast a high frequency, which the suit can then use to see just about anywhere in Gotham. He can also use the sonar vision to tap into people's cell phones so we can also use them to listen in on just what's going on in Gotham and what people are saying, which is pretty creepy. However, Lucius was not a fan of the sonar vision because he felt it was unethical, equating it to spying on millions of people whenever it was being used. So while this was cool tech, it was never really fully utilized because Lucius disagreed with his design for sonar vision being used in this manner to spy on people. And he was the only one that Bruce trusted to ethically use it. In fact, Lucius's reaction was to agree to help Batman, but only once as he felt compelled to resign because of how this tech was going to be used. Granted, the tech had a self-destruct built in by Bruce, who knew Lucius probably wouldn't agree to using that tech all the time, and it was destroyed after the one-time use, implying that Fox stayed on and, of course, did not end up resigning. The plated suit also didn't provide as much protection and ended up getting Bruce injured to the point that he would need a cane. Still, a solid three out of five pouches, but I feel like speed should not be as important as the actual armor of the suit, in my mind. If Batman was like, yeah, I just want to move my neck, I'd be like, dude, I just want you to keep your neck, you know what I mean? Number six, Mark I. The Mark I bat suit comes to us from Batman the Telltale series, an episodic based playable novel style video game where your choices as Batman influence the world and the story around you, meaning that you get to see what it feels like to literally be Batman. 
Batman. There are a few different versions of the Batsuit that we get throughout the evolution of the story and the game. The first suit you get to play with is, of course, the Mark I, which was primarily designed by Lucius Fox. The suits in the Telltale games really should not be underestimated, by the way. The Mark I comes armored, of course, protecting you as Batman against gunfire and even armor-piercing bullets. Aside from that, you also get more heavily armored gauntlets to defend against incoming attacks on your exposed jawline. The suit also comes with tech that allows you to pilot and control drones, so you can plan combat strategies and get surveillance before jumping into a fight. It also comes with a voice modulator, hacking equipment, visual holographic, and criminal and forensic analysis capabilities, thermal imaging, night vision, and sticky bombs. This suit gets a 3 out of 5 pouches rating from me. And that's just the first model from the game, so yeah, it also gets better from there. But I like the Mark 1, so I wanted to talk about that one. Number 5, Nomex. Even though the Nomex suit was actually designed before the plated Batsuit armor in Christopher Nolan's Dark Knight trilogy, I still actually think that this one is better and a more powerful suit overall. It offered Bruce a lot more protection when in battle. It made him almost bullet and knife proof with its Kevlar biweave. This armor was actually based on a rejected military design that, while impressive, was considered too costly by the US military for them to use. Or any other military. That's how expensive it was. Obviously not an issue for Bruce Wayne, though. The suit was created by Lucius Fox and would later be modified by Bruce and Alfred. For the purpose of this list, we're focusing on that modified version, which has a few key improvements that allow Batman to easily eavesdrop on conversations in the vicinity but out of earshot, an improved helmet, as the original one was defective, and a latex coating which helps to mask Batman's heat signature. The major downside with this suit is that flexibility is reduced somewhat, making Batman a bit slower in battle and preventing him from turning his head. Still, I give the Nomex suit 4 out of 5 pouches. Number 4, Prime. Obviously one of the best suits around has to still be the Earth Prime suit. It is one of the most modern and because it isn't restricted to the cinematic realism we often apply to films to make sure characters aren't too powerful and to also make sure things are logical for people that are watching, it can be a little bit more OP. The suit is also made of Kevlar with some titanium also thrown in the mix. It's bulletproof and also helps to protect Batman from high impact damage and blunt force trauma. So if he falls out of a window from a low rise building, he'll likely be able to still get up and even possibly recover and continue the fight. It's also flame retardant. His mask also has a thin lead lining to protect him from x-ray powers and abilities and includes sonar capabilities, enhanced auditory sensors, infrared and night vision. Like the plated suit from the Dark Knight trilogy, his mask also comes equipped with defensive measures like an electrical shock or gas emissions which help to protect Batman's secret identity should someone try to unmask him. In his utility belt, he also carries a slew of tools that we've seen him utilize over the years in battle, including a kryptonite ring gifted to him by Superman himself, just in case it should ever be needed. I give the Prime suit 4 out of 5 utility belt pouches. Lots of cool stuff in that utility belt. Number 3, Project Batman Exosuit. The Project Batman Exosuit was created for Jim Gordon when he filled in as Batman after the events of Endgame. Not only was Jim Gordon trained up and enhanced himself in order to become the newly appointed Batman, but he was also given this nifty suit to use as well. The suit had two layers, a very svelte undersuit, which was sleek and trim that Gordon wore, and the mechanical exosuit, which was like a small mech. This suit came equipped with live rounds, rocket launchers, and all the bells and whistles when it came to tech. It came with a neural guidance system, emergency response equipment including a defibrillator, fire and heat sonics, cannons, a retractable thermoresist blackout visor, rocket boosters, and camouflage capabilities. It was pretty nuts. Oh, it could also just do its own thing and you didn't even have to pilot. It could be like on autopilot and also be like helping Jim Gordon while he was Batman outside of the suit as well, which is nuts. For the Project Batman suit, I gotta give it a solid 4 out of 5 pouches, because it is crazy. I mean, imagine if Batman wore that suit. That would be nuts. Like, Bruce Wayne Batman, not Jim Gordon Batman, who was good, but... You know, he's not Bruce Wayne. Number two, Hellbat. Hellbat is an amazing suit of basically nanotech armor. It was created for Batman by the Justice League to help him increase his stats for battles in which he was completely outclassed. The suit is extremely durable, tough and strong, and can be summoned or dismissed at will via AI tech. The suit has cloaking capabilities, can give Batman literal wings to fly on, and can produce a powerful energy blast from its bat insignia. The downside with this suit is that it's not indestructible 
indestructible, and powerful enemies like Darkseid have damaged it before. It also drains Batman's metabolism when he uses it to increase his own physical abilities, such as strength, toughness, or speed, so he needs to be careful as overuse of this element of the suit could actually end up resulting in his death. Still, Batman doesn't even need the Justice League to reassemble this suit after it's first made, and not only does it look cool, but it is very, very OP. I give this suit five out of five utility belt pouches. Maybe even six, actually. It's pretty crazy. I don't know if there's a six on this list, but these last few, they're definitely pushing it. Number one, Insider. The Insider was a super cool spy suit that Batman used after he returned from being MIA, but was believed dead following a battle with Darkseid, which didn't actually leave him dead, but did leave him having weird time travel adventures. It was a long story. Returning home, he decided to check in with the Bat family and see how they were doing in his absence with the care of Gotham before revealing himself, because Batman. He created a suit to help disguise himself, which had various different modes that allowed him to basically mimic the powers of various members of the Justice League to help keep his identity secret. Although he also included Batman himself in those modes because Batman is also a member of the Justice League. And it'd be weird if he didn't. If he didn't, I feel like people might be like, maybe it's Batman pretending to be everybody else. This allowed him to maintain an air of mystery, while also giving him a really powerful and cool power set with his suit. Oh yeah, and he could also fly and teleport in this suit, because why not? Couldn't teleport super far, but he could still teleport. I give this suit 5 out of 5 pouches, and some bonus Batarang style points, because it's super cool. Throw those Batarangs around. Number 10, Wolverine's Patch Disguise. Wolverine's Patch Disguise. <laughs> Okay, bub. So you know I'm a big Wolverine fan. And if you follow me elsewhere on the interwebs, you may also know I'm a big Patch fan. However, even I, a major fan, can acknowledge how ridiculous this look and disguise is. While the Gambit miniseries we got recently did help to justify Gambit's kind of weird costume choices, the Patch miniseries definitely did not do that. Although that miniseries, written by Wolverine writing legend Larry Hama, which takes us back in time for an untold tale from the Patch era, is still amazing and you should definitely check it out. The funny thing is how even in the comics the other characters who interact with Patch and Madripoor eventually fess up to the fact that they pretty much always knew Patch was Wolverine, admitting that his attempt at a disguise is as ridiculous and dumb as we all thought it was. Still, I do love the Patch look so this is more me pointing out how silly it is as opposed to dumb in like a bad way. This is actually a lovably dumb superhero suit, I would say. And friends, before we move on to our next spot on this list. If you love what we do here at Top 10 Nerd, why not show us you love us by clicking that like button. Number 9, Superman Red and Blue. Admittedly, these designs are actually kind of really cool, but it's more the power sets that come with them and how they attempted to, in essence, reset Superman with these looks that makes them kind of Dumb. Although I do admire DC for wanting to change up the design and the character, which honestly was a revolutionary choice. The fact remains that this is comics and returning to a status quo, especially for a character as old and as respected as Supes, is kind of necessary, which is why this didn't really work and a lot of people didn't really like it. Number 8, Ghost Suit. Ghost in the MCU is pretty insane when it comes to her suit. While no longer really a villain by the end of the Ant-Man and the Wasp film from 2018, she did start out as one. Her suit allows her to become intangible, making her a lot harder to fight. Basically, it helps her to like control her abilities and stabilize them. Intangibility to me and phasing have always been considered as some of the strongest powers out there. And last time I checked, this was not an ability that Tony's suit had. So I have to consider Ghost stronger for that reason. I would be curious to see what a matchup between MCU's Ghost and even MCU's Iron Man would look like. Although for this list, we're obviously comparing the comic book version and the specific armor model that I mentioned mentioned earlier, so keep that in mind. If you think that MCU Iron Man would take MCU Ghost, which I'm not even sure if that's how that would go down myself, but yeah. Number 7, Lex Luthor's War Suit. Oftentimes when Lex Luthor dons a war suit, it's because he means business. Usually this goes down when Lex is ready to tussle with Superman, and while I think Iron Man is pretty powerful, I wouldn't say he is anywhere near Superman levels of strength. This is because he is mainly just, you know, a guy in a suit. Take him out of the suit, and well, he 
becomes just another squishy super genius. Lex Luthor's war suit is not only built to take on the powerhouse that is Superman, but with a few modifications from Lex, I think it could easily be used to destroy Iron Man and his suit. Lex is also a master when it comes to exploiting the weaknesses of his nemeses, which I think in Tony's case might be the arc reactor that keeps him alive, which to many is pretty apparent. I mean, it's like right there. So I would say if he swapped out some of the kryptonite abilities and weapons the war suit has for stuff that focuses instead on Tony's weakness, I would be pretty worried to see Iron Man take on Lex. And I think Lex might take that one. Number six, Dr. Doom's Iron Man Model Prime armor. The Model Prime Iron Man suit is one of the suits that Tony was using during Civil War II. However, Tony swapped out this suit for a different one that was designed specifically to be used in his fight against Carol Danvers, Captain Marvel. After Stark was knocked into a coma as a result of Civil War II, Victor Von Doom for a while played the role of hero, being one of those to step into Stark's shoes, metal shoes, for a time as the infamous Iron Man. The suit he donned was the Model Prime armor, but of course with a few adjustments made to this armor. For one, he added a bunch more repulsor beams, going from like just one to having multiple that could all fire at once, which is pretty scary stuff. Victor also enhanced the armor using dark art spells as well to improve upon it. So technically, this is, yes, an Iron Man suit that was technically initially made by Stark, but it isn't the model that we're using as the base, and in this instance, for this period, it was actually in Doom's possession. So although Tony made it, it was Doom's suit. Also, yes, Doom was acting as a hero at the time, but, I mean, the name says it all, infamous Iron Man. And I would still say we more consider him a villain than a hero, just in general, at this point in time anyways. Although I've definitely been noticing a slow shift over the years from villain to reformed hero with Doom, but I don't think we're quite there yet. Number five, Kang's armor. Something we don't often think about is the fact that basically Kang is his suit. I mean, Kang is also a super genius from the future, but when it comes to his powers, that's pretty much all his suit and his tech. And as Adam said on his superhero version of this list, there is something major that Tony Stark's armor can't do that some other character suits can, and that is time travel. In Kang's case, his armor allows him to do this, along with giving him super strength, super durability, the ability to fire concussive blasts, and for a while, the ability to upload his consciousness into a new body if he died. So basically making him immortal. Number four, Carnage with the Grendel symbiote. I mean, Cletus Cassidy with the Carnage symbiote is pretty ridiculous already, and while I'm sure Iron Man would find a way to subdue Carnage, I feel like Carnage revived as the Grendel symbiote would be pretty unstoppable, even for Tony Stark in one of his most modern standard suits. I mean, when we think about absolute carnage and everything that happened there, it was a pretty crazy event, and I just feel like if you try to throw Tony in there, he's not gonna be the person to be able to beat Grendel symbiote carnage. Number three, Apocalypse's celestial armor. While it isn't as often talked about, Apocalypse also has his own suit, built by some of the most brilliant and most powerful people in the entire universe. Perhaps even the multiverse, the Celestials. I think it's important to remember when we talk about Apocalypse how closely integrated he is with the Celestials. Not only does he have access to one of their ships and access to their tech, which he can use to modify mutants or other beings, evolving them and manipulating their bodies and abilities as he pleases, but he also has access to their tech, their weapons, and even the armor made for those who served them. It is believed that this armor actually helps to enhance the naturally evolved powers and abilities of the wearer and it has also been shown to be fairly indestructible, as was evident when Apocalypse fought against Thor way back in the past. That's the thing that happened. <laughs> I feel like Thor has fought everyone in the past. Number two, Maestro in the Destroyer Armor. Woo! Maestro in the Destroyer armor is just insane. This is the armor that Maestro donned when he happened to completely decimate God Emperor Doom, which in and of itself is already wildly powerful. Never mind if it were to be combined with Hulk's tyrannical alternate version, Maestro. That being said, this turns out to be simply an illusion that Maestro experiences in Future Imperfect. But still, if it happens in a dream, a fantasy, or even in an illusion in Marvel Comics, it's treated as though this possibility possibility does exist somewhere in the multiverse, so even this instance has its own like designated universe, contained in its own separate but very real world. So I think we can still count it based on that. And also it just like looks super cool, so like obviously I gotta talk about it. <laughs> Number one, Bruce Banner's Spaceship Hulk. Bruce Banner has one of my favorite suits on this list because his suit is literally the Hulk. While many consider Bruce Banner like the Hulk to be a hero, I would say he's definitely been acting a little less heroic 
as of late. And that kind of a little bit more selfish, but I'm also kind of like, kind of here for it. I mean, he did turn the Hulk into his spaceship, which is honestly pretty dastardly. Near the beginning of the current Hulk series by Donnie Cates and Ryan Otley, Tony at one point attempts to apprehend Bruce, who is fully in control of the cybernetically modified Hulk. And guess what? It doesn't go well. Which just goes to show you how insanely powerful this suit version being controlled by Banner is. Hulk is beset by multiple Hulk busters, and with Hulk's Rage only turned up to the level of one out of 10 on Banner's Rage engine room throttle, I think it's safe to say that Banner in his Hulk suit could easily decimate Tony entirely if he wanted to. In fact, that's kind of what's implied in that issue. Like he's like, look, I'm just gonna leave, but like literally he probably just could have killed Tony there if he wanted to. Number 10, Sasha Hammer's Detroit Steel Armor. Time to set down some parameters here before we jump into the legacy that is Sasha Hammer's. So when I'm talking about Iron Man and his suit, we're actually talking about his base suit. Specifically, I'm gonna be thinking in my mind of Iron Man Armor Model 70, which first appeared in the 2020 Iron Man series and was created by Christopher Cantwell and Alex Ross. Despite being one of the newest models, this armor was created to be a somewhat sleeker and somewhat shinier version of Tony's base armor in terms of its design. Also, look at them metal thighs. I love the thighs in this suit. His thighs are like metal gold. Man, I wish everyone had gold thighs. I just feel like that's such a cool thing. If I could wear metal pants, I would. This suit was used during Null's invasion of Earth and has a pretty sweet repulsor setting known as the can opener, which allows Tony to basically destroy other Iron Man suits. However, it should be noted that this setting can't be used very often as requires a lot of power and therefore has a limited charge. So although for some of you, you might be like, but couldn't you use that to destroy all suits? Well, not exactly. And also like not even all the time. So yeah, but it is a cool feature. Sasha Hammer is the granddaughter of industrialist and businessman, Justin Hammer, being the daughter of Justine Hammer and the Mandarin. Talk about a legacy villain. Her and her mom, Justine, became natural enemies of Tony Stark's Iron Man. At one point, they created their own tech security company, Detroit Steel. It was during this time that they attempted to discredit Iron Man Man and eventually attack him outright. While Iron Man would ultimately defeat Sasha and Detroit Steel in this instance, he would need quite a bit of backup to do so. And this wouldn't be the last that we'd hear of her, with her later becoming the pilot of the Detroit Steel armor and returning on the scene. Honestly, I kind of love Sasha and I wish they had done more with her in the comics. Like, come on, bring her back, Marvel. Who's writing Iron Man right now? Jerry Dugan, Jerry Dugan, come on. Bring back Sasha Hammer, she's so cool. And friends, before we move on to our next spot on this list, if you love what we do here at Top 10 Nerd and you love when we talk about awesome suits that people wear, you can check out our suits playlist. That's a new playlist that we just made for this. So check it out. Number nine, Dr. Doom's Mystical Armor. Well, Dr. Doom's Mystical Armor hasn't been super established in terms of its properties, power levels, and abilities. It is clear that this armor is pretty OP. I mean, already it comes with Doom wearing it and fighting Doom is pretty wild. But even aside from that, Doom also is is believed to get a pretty mighty power boost to his magic abilities while wearing it, giving him enough mystical power to defeat even the Sorcerer Supreme, Doctor Strange. Also, I feel like in one of those instances where you have tech versus magic, like I'm always gonna put my money on magic, you know what I mean? Number eight, Swordsman. I don't know about you, but I personally find Jacques Duquesne's look uh, a little silly. Like what is happening with that helmet? Is that a helmet? It's not right because it's like, it's like attached to his whole outfit. Which is also really weird. What's happening there? Also, I don't mind the tunic and the tights, but the weird pink and purple color combination here is interesting for color choices. At least that's how I see the colors. I don't know if you guys see pink and purple, but that's what I'm seeing here. And the fact that while he has gloves on to protect his hands, he has nothing to cover his arms, except for, I guess, those armbands. What are the armbands for? Are they supposed to protect him or are they like just for adornment? The thing I love about the modern look for the Katati version of this character by comparison to the original human swordsman who first appeared in Marvel Comics back in the 60s is that at least this plant version, while still not having full sleeves, had the improved design of wearing bracers. Honestly, I think that makes more sense for a master swordsman rather than gloves and armbands. And also, just for context, I was talking about the original swordsman design there, so. 
Number 7 Asriel's Batman As per Saya Dubre's suggestion from the comments on part 1 of this list, I had to include Jean Paul Valley's Batman outfit here. You're completely right Saya, it is one of the most 90s outfits around. And while I am a big fan of dumb 90s outfits, that doesn't make them any less dumb. It just means that I love things that are dumb, which is I also I think fine. And this outfit is definitely included in the list of dumb 90s outfits for sure. From the weird cape collar to the metal accents and back again to the insane amount of muscle definition that we can see through what must be the tightest fitting outfit ever. Also metal garters, I mean having a metal garter on your leg I imagine that has to be uncomfortable. Number 6 Wolverine's No Nose Wolverine's Nose is not really a suit at all, but it is a whole look that Wolverine had for a time that was bizarre. And I thought, hey, if Tony's Iron Nose can make the cut on AJ's part 1, it's important that I also include Wolverine's Nose on part 2 here. While Iron Man having a nose added to his suit was weird for the character, Wolverine had the opposite problem of completely losing his nose, which was also weird for the character. However, at least this was more of a stylistic choice inspired by the story than you know an arbitrary change to the design based on where Iron Man's eyes are. So I will at least say that in the defense of this pretty strange look for the character. It came as a result of Wolverine having the adamantium coating ripped from his bones by Magneto, which also turned him feral. For a few years he'd become more bestial in nature than he normally was, which apparently also meant his nose, I guess, had to go, becoming more of a flat central spot on his face with two nostrils, kind of like became pushed into his face. Almost. I mean, honestly, this version of Wolverine almost becomes unrecognizable when you take the nose off. Number 5 Smallville's Aquaman Whether we're talking sleeves or no sleeves, second generation or first generation, the Aquaman look for Smallville was pretty ridiculous and honestly kind of dumb in a bad way. While I typically try to approach dumb lists with less of that kind of outlook because you know dumb doesn't always have to mean bad and it definitely doesn't usually mean bad for me, this costume in my opinion is actually pretty atrocious. I, I Honestly I don't really like this one. Honestly I think I'd rather have the golden age look with the weird fins on his arms and his legs over this one. It just looks like a weird jogging outfit to me, and I know it's probably supposed to be like a wetsuit, but no. Just just let's not. Let's pretend it didn't happen. Except we can't because it's on this list. So now we all have to remember it. Number 4, The Crossing Thor. I mean, everyone in The Crossing looked pretty wild, but Thor is definitely up there for me personally. The Crossing is the event where we learned that this whole time Iron Man had been basically a sleeper agent for Immortus, aka an alternate timeline version of Kang the Conqueror. The whole time. Dun dun dun. In honor of this very important and historical time, Thor and many of the other Avengers ended up with kind of new looks. Now Thor's costume was definitely the most 90s 90s look I think I've ever seen. The only thing it's missing really for me is pouches, honestly. What it lacks in pouches though, it makes up for with everything else in abundance. Tons of chains and elaborate excessive harnesses and one of those weird like face masks that covers part of your face like the sides and the top but leaves a hole on the top of it for your hair to come out. And of course, I believe this was actually supposed to be what future Thor was meant to look like in this comic in like another timeline, despite this look truly screaming 90s. In the story, this appeared to be a vision that we got of what a future Thor would look like. Now thank goodness that hasn't ended up happening in this current timeline, at least not yet anyways. I don't know, that might still be somewhere lurking. <laughs> Number 3, Star Sapphire. When it comes to Star Sapphire, Carol Ferris, she isn't always a hero and she isn't always a villain either. She's kind of done both of those things. She served both roles, but either way, she usually does so pretty ridiculously dressed, I gotta be honest. I mean, not always. She's had some reasonable costume designs and some that I've liked, but for this point, I'm focusing on her one piece bathing suit like costume with the middle of it cut out to the point that it becomes theoretically structurally unsound, I'd say. For the record, I don't mind a woman who shows off her body. In fact, you know, I too enjoy that, both as a woman and both as someone looking at women, especially when it comes from a place of empowerment. I don't really mind anyone showing off their body as long as they're the ones making that choice for themselves and it makes sense. Truly, doing so can not only be a good showcase of confidence, but also of self love and self celebration, and that. 
That's hot to me. But this costume is just objectively ridiculous because how does it stay on? I mean, I know that it's, you know, probably like a construct likely created by Carol so we can explain it away with what is basically like kind of cosmic magic. But imagine cosplaying this look. Imagine it. Just imagine you wearing this costume and how does that work? Without added invisible straps or a literal glue or tape, it becomes impossible. And for that reason, I have to call it dumb because logically in our world at least, where sadly there are no green or violet lanterns, it simply doesn't work as it appears. Also, I have only ever seen people successfully cosplay this look with invisible straps. Glue would likely damage your outfit and honestly it's really hard on your skin, I know because I've worn it under costumes before, and tape would probably sweat off unless it was really cold out. And I know because I'm not a super sweaty person and I've also worn tape before and experienced that. Which uh, you know, if you have to wear it in the cold too, you'd be really cold in this look. So really the only option is invisible straps, which clearly Carol doesn't need somehow in the comics as she's never drawn with them. Unless maybe she is, but they're invisible so we don't see them. Even invisible straps you usually see them, so it just makes no sense. <laughs> Number two, the crossing wasp. I don't just want to talk about the crossing here, folks, but as ridiculous as Thor's look is, wasps is possibly even more wild. Now, she kind of had two looks as well. The one she wore at the beginning, which is kind of like a metallic bodysuit that somehow like fits her like spandex and possibly even has a metal pocket on the legs. I'm not sure. I saw that in one of the panels I was looking at and I was like, wait a minute. Does she have like metal cargo pants that are skin tight? It looks like a pocket to me. The second is after she is resurrected in Avengers issue 394 and comes back literally looking like a pink bug woman with bright pink hair and bright pink wings. Number one, original peacemaker. I have to say, I I really love how dumb this look is. And I love that we managed to somehow keep it in the DCU almost one for one. The reason why I went with the original version of Peacemaker's costume from his days at Charlton Comics isn't just because of the white pants, which to me are an absurd fashion choice to make when you know you're headed into a fray. Wearing, I mean, wearing white pants in general for me is like a huge thing. I'm a messy person in my day to day, so I can't imagine getting into a fight with white pants on. But the other thing that I really think is strange about this that really gets me is the weird giant helmet. It looks like there's like a thick doorway sitting on top of Peacemaker's head. At number 10, we have the Rainbow Batman suit from Detective Comics number 241. This is the suit where we get to see Bruce Wayne's fashionista persona as he gets to fight crime in all sorts of different colored suits from green to purple to yellow to white to red, which on the cover looks more like a neon pink to me. And of course, Rainbow. Now you might wonder why the Dark Knight would want to wear all these costumes, but as always when it comes to Batman, the explanation is purely logical and slightly convoluted. See, the Bat Diva did this in order to draw attention towards himself and away from Robin, who earlier had performed a heroic act as Dick Grayson, pushing a girl out of the way of a speeding car and injuring his arm in the process. And since Batman don't believe in work from home culture, and to his credit it is the 50s, he takes the money he would have spent on Robin's paid leave and cops himself some new fancy outfits so that no one would pay attention to Robin's arm and realize his secret identity. If you're enjoying the video so far, do me a quick solid and support the channel by pressing like, subscribing to Top 10 Nerd, and ringing that notification bell. Goes a long way. Thanks guys. At number 9 we have Raven's New 52 redesign from Teen Titans number 17. Raven's original cloak is simple, elegant, and iconic, and so to recapitulate that essence for the New 52, they took all that and put it in the garbage and just went, Raven? Hmm, needs feathers. Listen, I know she's supposed to be gloomy and mysterious and whatnot, but covering her face completely is stupid, and what they covered it with looks ridiculous. Not to mention the whole bird theme as a whole is severely uninspired. And also the knee pads. Why does she need freaking knee pads? Heck, if you're gonna take it that far, you might as well throw in some elbow pads, shin guards, and a jock strap for good measure. Morons. Number eight, Martian Manhunter. This was really the only suggestion I got from the comments on 
on our part 2. People were saying that we never talk about male characters in skimpy outfits and how those are dumb and Martian Manhunter was one of the ones that was suggested. And I do agree that Martian Manhunter does have a weird outfit, but I also didn't know too much about his outfit and what it means. So I decided to look into it. And as I was expecting, while this outfit does look pretty ridiculous with Martian Manhunter's little shorts and his X straps over his bare chest with his long flowy cape, it turns out there is actually a reason behind it. So. It kind of does make sense. Martian Manhunter being a shapeshifter, it's as I expected, and apparently his clothes are actually just him because he's a shapeshifter. It's just a weird thing to think about. His suit, therefore, is something he chose to shapeshift into, and it seems to be inspired by the heroes around him. Martian Manhunter in his normal form actually looks more alien even than we know him to look, and is a little bit more spiky. And so his appearance on Earth is actually him trying to stay true to his Martian heritage while still shifting his appearance somewhat to look more humanoid, so he'll be more accepted, and he makes himself look like he's wearing clothes that he feels makes him look heroic, as that's what he wants to be. He wants to be a hero. So if you think Martian Manhunter dresses weird, it's really kind of a reflection of how Martian Manhunter sees most male superhero costumes and just superhero costumes in general, and maybe the way that we see them. In fact, I definitely see inspiration in his look from another alien superhero, Superman. You know, with his green skin and his little booty shorts which sometimes are like little briefs. It's kind of got a Superman vibe to it a little bit. Number seven, Susan Storm's cutout suit. Oh boy. This is a 90s classic in some of the worst ways I think I can safely say. Now, I love a woman in a sexy costume, but this one is a lot, even for me. And what's worse, they made it narratively so that Sue designed this one herself, which feels not right for the character, but hey. If that feels pretty out of character for Sue, who refers to feeling like an old frump, in her previous suit. You're not alone in thinking that, by the way. Many people like to defend this costume by actually saying that narratively its creation makes sense because it came from her evil persona, Malice, actually, who was still possessing and influencing Sue at the time, and that this is actually an indicator of that. Well, this might be true, I'm still skeptical as to this being the real reason outside of the canon for this redesign. And even if that is the only reason, she had this suit. I still don't really like it because as a Sue Storm fan, it doesn't actually come from Sue herself, but from Malice, who was controlling her at the time. Which I know Malice is kind of like a part of her, but she's like the evil part of her. So there's really not as much agency here for Sue. Number six, Vision. Marvel Comics initially had a completely different character who was known as the hero Vision. This was actually back, I believe, when they were timely, before they were known as Marvel Comics. Marvel Comics would ultimately, of course, ditch their original version of the character and later get a completely new version, an android instead of an alien, who would end up as the Vision we know and love today. Not only is this original Vision's costume a product of the times, that insanely thick gold belt that he's wearing, but if you consider Martian Manhunter's costume to be ridiculous, Vision likely inspired that look, having a similar origin and a similar appearance initially, and appearing 15 years earlier in the comics in 1940, whereas Martian Manhunter I believe first appeared in 1955, so yeah. Number Number 5. Mangaverse Black Cat Mangaverse Black Cat has a pretty wild look. To be fair to the universe, this one fits, I would say, in regards to, you know, a manga look, but boy oh boy is it strange when you think of Black Cat's standard look over on Earth 616. I mean, Black Cat has always been a sexy character, as many are in comics, but she doesn't usually have quite a deep v-neck. I'm not sure how exactly this suit also really functions. It must be made of some very firm material or like glued into place for it to stay on. Also missing are the tufts of white fur we're used to seeing Felicia wear, which I actually do miss. I really like those. I still feel like those could have been incorporated in some way in this look, but I guess they wanted to move away from having this version of the character look too similar to her, you know, 616 counterpart, which honestly, fair enough. But still, the deep V and the super long claws for me feel pretty weird. Maybe it's just because I'm not as into manga as I used to be, I don't know, but that's where we're at. Number four, Doctor Strange, a new Sorcerer Supreme. The 90s was a time when many folks got new looks. Some of them were, no, actually almost all of them were pretty terrible. 
But that's why we love them, right? Steven was not exempt from this. He got one of the most mystical 90s looks after years of having what I would say was a relatively unchanged costume. It didn't change that much. And even today, it's kind of got a similar vibe. His costume was tweaked here and there, but usually for the most part, it's just been slightly updated. But this, this was a pretty crazy refresh for him. His hair was even different. This transformation took place in issue number 75 of Doctor Strange Sorcerer Supreme, where Steven revealed himself at the end as the true Doctor Strange. The sunglasses are what really get me with this one, though honestly, I kinda wanna cosplay as 90s Strange now. I mean, what a vibe. Also, I love that he comes out and he's like, the sun, I must put on sunglasses. <laughs> to make sense of why he's wearing sunglasses. Which I mean, you know, you gotta make sense of that, otherwise how am I supposed to accept as a reader? Number three, Starfire from Red Hood and the Outlaws. Based on how the comments looked for part two, I can already feel the animosity surrounding this point just building up, just for me even mentioning it. I could end the point here and I feel like people would rage. But regardless, I'm gonna dive into my perspective of this one anyways, because, well, I mean, that's what I'm here to do, so that's what we're gonna do. Talking about costumes that I think are somewhat dumb, and so we're gonna get into that. As I've said before though, and I will say again, Again, dumb to me doesn't always mean bad. It can mean illogical, silly, or contradictory. It doesn't necessarily mean bad. I love a lot of bad costumes myself, so they're not bad bad. They're just, I don't know, on paper good. Does that make sense? Well, I don't actually mind the design. I do think this look for Starfire was a bit much. I do think Starfire makes sense wearing less based on her energy absorption abilities. However, that being said, her first costume was basically just like a one-piece swimsuit with some cutouts. This is like not even a bikini level of coverage. It's like a bikini bottoms with cutouts with like a collar shoulder thing and pasties and I mean it's definitely an homage to that original look but they undressed it even more for like really no reason. Add in the fact that Starfire was also an amnesiac at the beginning of this run and I feel like we could have done better by Cory here. It would actually be less ridiculous to me if Cory was the one to have chosen this with all her memories attached then it would actually have some agency. This was kind of just a weird time in general for her character. Also because it bears is repeating, apparently, I am not critiquing the outfit because it is sexy. It's more the issue of how extreme it is and what was going on for Starfire in the story when she wore this look. I like sexy costumes. I like characters who wear sexy costumes. That's all fine with me. Number two, Superman's t-shirt and jeans look. I mean, what even is this look? I understand wanting to modernize your character's appearance and give them something totally different, but a t-shirt and jeans just seems a little too low key. And I know it had a narrative explanation but still, it's pretty ridiculous. This is the outfit Superman wore when he drove around the US on a motorbike. He couldn't fly at the time, and uh, what a time it was. I will say though, this one would be really easy to cosplay at least, so it gets some points for that, because I mean, anyone could do this look. I could do this look, I could be this Superman. Number one, Red Sonja's chainmail bikini. Now of course, I have cosplayed as Red Sonja, but even I could admit that her outfit is pretty ridiculous. And I say this with much love for this outfit. The whole point of wearing chainmail is to protect you, so wearing it in a bikini form, it doesn't really make any sense. The only thing I can say about this that kind of makes sense is Red Sonja really doesn't care what other people think of her, so I can see her wearing a chainmail bikini because you just didn't care, but not, it's not good armor, you know what I mean? And sure, it's an iconic look that I will happily wear any day of the week, well as long as I'm feeling like wearing a chainmail bikini, but that doesn't change how goofy it is, as is evident by many of those who write and draw her changing up what she wears inside the comics while kind of saving that iconic look more for either a single moment in a story or just for the cover. So I feel like even creative teams acknowledge this. Number 10, Spider-Man's 2021 hoodie suit. Spider-Man's 2021 hoodie costume is definitely an odd one. Now I'm not gonna lie, this one didn't bother me myself too much. There are parts of it I actually kind of like. I actually really like his shoes. But I do know people who pretty passionately felt that this look is ridiculous. And I'm including it because I value the specific person's opinion who actually even mentioned that to me and I think they made a fair point for why it was so silly so I'm going to indulge. The Spider-Man we are talking about here is of course Miles Morales and the look we're talking about is the one he donned before this current look that he's in right now which is kind of a return to more of his classic look. I like to call this specific look though his hoodie costume although to be fair that's a little confusing because he has another hoodie costume but anyways hoodie 2021. It basically looks like he's wearing a hoodie 
hoodie with leggings, and of course, sweet kicks. Of course, I will say this costume looks super comfy, which for me makes more sense than some of the other things that superheroes are known for wearing, but it also greatly deviates from his normally sleek design, which is, I think, what was missing for most who weren't fans of this look. While it is a bit goofy looking, especially with the leggings, which I, I gotta say, I kind of agree, kinda wish he had looser pants to kinda match his hoodie, this costume was actually made by one of Miles' friends as a replacement, so at least it also had a reason for existing in the story. And friends, before I move on to our next spot on this list, if you love what we do here at Top 10 Nerd, why not show us you love us and you love talking about all the dumb, weird costumes by giving this video a thumbs up. I love dumb costumes. Number 9, Wonder Woman's Secretary Look. Forget the old, the new Wonder Woman is here, and she is depowered and working as a spy and business owner, baby. The kind of Wonder Woman you probably never really asked to see, but the 70s gave it to us anyways. Admittedly, the actual fashion sense of this look is pretty great, I gotta say. So although in some ways this is kind of dumb, I also feel like the actual fashion amazing. And I mean all around throughout as well. But the fact that it comes with Diana not having her powers anymore is pretty tragic, which is why it's going to make our cut. Even though this was done in an effort to actually promote feminism at the time. The revamp was actually intended by the creative team behind it to encourage other women to strive for independence and was actually pretty well executed, I gotta say. Even though taking away Diana's powers would in retrospect be seen as a downgrade for the character in regards to her history. Which is why this makes our cut, even though I understand what they were trying to do was not that, but it unfortunately ended up being seen as a, a setback as opposed to a move forward for the character. At number 8 we have Cyborg Spider-Man from Spider-Man number 21. This is probably the most 90s Spider-Man costume out there, though I wouldn't be surprised if one of you guys in the comments proved me wrong. Solo nearly ended Spider-Man, believing him to be Doc Ock thanks to an illusion cast onto him by Mysterio. But Peter was rescued in the nick of time by Cyborg X who took him to Care Labs to get fixed up where he would awake with a new metal cast, an eyepiece, and some stitches. He was even gifted a utility belt though Spidey never puts this one to use. And while the original version of the Cyborg suit is disbanded fairly quickly, probably on account of it being so hard to look at, it's worth mentioning that a Pete from a different timeline decided to go all in with the cybernetic enhancements, leading to a truly Cyborg Spider-Man whose costume is seriously done right. We're even gonna get a fresh take of the character on screen in the the next Spider-Verse movie with Cyborg Spider-Woman and I'm all about it. Well, save for the spiky shoulder guard. Personally, I feel it's a little bit out of place, but maybe we'll get a good enough explanation for it in the movie, but probably not. At number 7 we have the Superman Unchained Armor from Superman Unchained number 7. Okay look, we can all agree that the Unchained Armor is undoubtedly badass looking. That's not my point here. My gripe is the fact that Superman's wearing it. You see, Cal dons the armor when he realizes that he's vulnerable to attack from the weapons wielded by General Lane's army. And the suit, which comes with a hammer and shield, is able to withstand a few blows that supposedly would have one shot the Man of Steel. Okay then, so why does he need a shield? He is Superman after all, it's not like he needs anything other than his fists for combat. Or better yet, why doesn't he just ditch the suit altogether and just keep the shield, as it proves to be far more effective at sponging blows from Lane's weapons than the armor is. And don't even get me started on the hammer, which is literally only there to rip off Mjolnir. Not to mention how uncharacteristic and lazy it is of Superman just to put on thicker armor when a greater threat presents itself. Cause it would have been much more satisfying to see Superman Superman outwit his opponent instead of just out tanking him. Like, okay, DC, listen up. Maybe you can use this design for some sort of uh, Thor, Darth Maul, Megazord hybrid character, but Superman, guy doesn't need it. Give it to someone else. At number 6 we have Iron Man's nose from Iron Man number 68. There's change in the air. I can smell it! One of the most iconic examples of a redesign gone wrong, we have that period of time where Tony Stark thought it would be a good idea to include a nose in his mask to make him look more expressive and help strike fear into the heart of his enemies. Buddy, the only thing you're striking me with is an intense desire to laugh in your face, cause let's face it, the addition of a big metal nose, 
ain't exactly intimidating. Now you might be wondering why Marvel would even give him a nose in the first place. Well, well the story goes that one day Stan Lee was complaining about one of the studio's new artists. See, Stan thought that Tony's eyes were too close to the surface of the helmet for there to be any room for a nose underneath the mask, and so Stan asked, where's his nose? The editors took this to mean that Iron Man should have a nose, and so they gave him one. That is, until Stan caught wind of the change a few issues later, and demanded that the editors change it back. At number 5 we have Hawkeye's tunic in Avengers number 72. Good lord, dude! Pants! Not only is Hawkeye one of the bravest Avengers on account of him being super powerless, but to stand shoulder to shoulder with Earth's mightiest heroes in what's effectively a dress is a whole new level of courage. Not to mention that this was right after some very questionable decisions led to Hank Pym turning Hawkeye into the size changing Goliath. Not to mention that this was right after some very questionable decisions that led to Hank Pym turning Hawkeye into the size changing Goliath, who sports an equally decisive costume, that one including those redundant bolted shoulder and waist straps. Sorry to say buddy, but <laughs> this fit just makes you look arrogant. Arrogant? No? Okay, I tried. At number 4 we have Captain America's Exoskeleton, debuting in Captain America number 438. On yet another edition of why does this hero need a whole suit of armor, we have Captain America. And while his excuse is a little better than Superman's, it's still pretty lame. You see, Steve Rogers became completely paralyzed by an illness brought on by the very super soldier serum that granted him his superpowers in the first place. And so in order to allow Cap to continue his crime fighting career, Tony Stark fashioned him this exoskeleton. And after getting some implants that would enable him to operate it, Cap was back in action. Now I've included this one on the list cause the whole concept is a bit ridiculous. I mean, super soldier serum induced paralysis just makes the serum itself completely redundant. Like if you wanted to give Cap an Iron Man suit, just give Cap an Iron Man suit and do away with the whole degenerative disease nonsense. I mean, Spidey got an Iron Man suit, more than one, and he didn't need to get paralyzed to earn it. At number 3 we have Plaid Daredevil. Ok this next one is seriously cruel, and if you laugh, your soul is going straight to Mephisto. This panel comes from What If Volume 2 Number 17, the comic that asks what if Daredevil had a dishonest tailor, to which Kingpin and Punisher are seen laughing in his face. See I think this is dumb not cause of the plaid, although it is pretty ugly, but cause it's uncharacteristic. You see Daredevil wouldn't have gotten ripped off. He can't. He can literally smell fear and dishonesty. It's what makes him such a good lawyer. So either this universe's daredevil is missing one of his most crucial hyper senses, or he's Canadian. Either way, it's nothing to laugh about. At number 2 we have Hulk the Horseman of War from Incredible Hulk number 456. That's right, not only has Hulk been a villain, an avenger, a space gladiator, and the conqueror of entire planets, but now we can add first non-mutant war horseman of the apocalypse to his resume as well. His armor, made from celestial tech, allows him to accomplish feats of strength with ease, which the irregular Hulk would probably find at least a little strenuous, like, like picking up and tossing an entire Egyptian pyramid for instance. His helmet also has the added bonus of calming his inner demons, allowing the Hulk to become more cold and calculated. And if I'm being honest with you guys, the real reason I included this costume on the list is because it makes Hulk look like a jacked version of Marvin the Martian. Am I the only one who's made this connection? Can't be. And at number 1 we have Manga vs Black Panther, who made his very first in costume appearance in Marvel Manga vs Eternity Twilight. The Marvel Manga vs has plenty of questionable redesigns, I'm looking at you spider gloves, but when it comes to the King of Wakanda, Boy oh boy did they do him dirty. See, instead of utilizing the vibranium of his homeland to build himself a super suit, T'Challa of Earth 2301 seems to have replaced his sacred herb powers with the spirit of Kwamatha, transforming him into a furry. As if things weren't furry enough with Tigra around, who, after watching T'Challa transform, immediately gets the heart shaped eyes for him anime style. Ok look, maybe I wouldn't have so much hate for the suit if there was a suit to begin with, as the king's suggestively shaped loincloth leaves very little to the imagination. And the bat ears, ugh, why is he the only anthropomorph with hyper realistic ears? Kicking off the list at number 10 is Spawn. Of all the super suits, Spawn's may be one of the coolest. Spawn wears a living symbiotic costume called Letha of the 7th House of K, or K7 Letha. Unlike a symbiote though, Al Simmons dominates the suit instead of it trying to call the shots. But that doesn't mean the suit can't help him out. The shroud, spikes, chains, and skulls on the suit are all part of the organism 
that is the suit, and it's all bonded to Al's central nervous system. So the suit itself will protect Spawn even in the rare occasion that he is knocked unconscious. The costume is powered and feeds on the necroplasm inside of Spawn's body. Now, I know that sounds like a bad thing, but Al is totally able to draw this energy back to him when he needs it, using it to power his abilities without draining his own reserves. What's really cool is that K7 Letha can also feed off the ambient evil energy of people, animals, and even certain parts of cities. For example, Detroit, New York City, Los Angeles, etc, etc. As most people know, Al does have great magical power, but that power does have a limit. So, for the most part, Al relies on the suit's augmentation of his physical power, plus its ability to shapeshift. The suit can manifest spikes, armor plating, and the shroud itself is a really effective offensive tool, able to strike with extreme precision. He has used it to sever limbs, disarm enemies, and he has even transformed the shroud into a super sweet battle axe. Number 9. Blue Beetle There have been many blue beetles over time, and as they shifted, so did the technology that they use. But unlike Dan Garrett or Ted Kord, Jaime Reyes managed to bond with the blue beetle scarab which provided him with the suit that he wears, and it is sick. Similar to Spawn, Jaime's suit is also sentient and symbiotic, but it's pretty damn dangerous. It has the power to completely destroy a planet, and that's what it was intended to do. But thankfully, those who have been in possession of it have been able to override this prime directive and use its power for good. Although the scarab can and will act of its own accord, like when Jaime has been knocked unconscious, like Spawn, or even when Jaime has been mind controlled, normally it just kind of does what Jaime tells it to do. With such powerful tech, the beetle can hold his own against the likes of a green lantern since its power cuts through green lantern energy projections, and it can even take on Superman, creating kryptonite weapons to counter Kryptonian physiology. That's because the suit can create tools to fight against whatever threat it happens to be facing, while also shielding Reyes from any attacks from those same sources. It also looks pretty dope compared to the other Blue Beetles, and, and Iron Man himself, so that's a plus. At number 8 is the Extrema Blade armor, because if you're looking for something cooler than a symbiote like Venom, look no further than this cyborg symbiote, my friend. You see, this suit was originally one of many symbiote dragons, yes, you heard me right, dragons, but Tony got a hold of it and was able to reverse engineer the symbiote technology using a techno-organic extremist virus, rewriting the symbiote's DNA and severing its connection to the whole hive mind, giving Tony full control of the symbiote. Well, as much control as one could have over a symbiote. And speaking of which, here's a nice little fun fact. Symbiotes aren't aliens. Well, I mean, they are, as and they come from another planet, but they aren't naturally occurring creatures produced by nature. Instead, they're a synthetic life form created by this alien dude named Null. The more you know. Anyway, tangent over, back to the armor. Now, even though this new symbiote infused suit was a vast upgrade over the standalone Model 70, Tony would soon lose control over it after Carnage called out to Tony's symbiote from within the hive mind, forcing the suit to constrict with Tony inside, crushing Tony and snapping a few limbs and ribs in the process. <sighs> Ouch. Now let's talk capabilities. The Extrema Blade is a unique mix of synthetic alien life and Stark's latest tech, which means it's got all kinds of cool tricks up its sleeve? Like, for example, the symbiote's ability to manipulate its form and project tendrils or increase its body mass considerably. Or how about the upgraded repulsor beam, now equipped to blast the corruption right off of Null's victims? He's also used the Extremo Bite as what I can only describe as a celestial dongle so that he can take control of an even more powerful celestial body, which we're about to break down in the next entry. But by far the coolest ability is the fact that this suit allows Tony to fly around in style as the thing can morph into a freaking symbiote dragon. Yes, you heard me right, Iron Man riding dragons. Guys, we're only on number eight here. At number seven, the celestial armor. Well, what do we have here? Is that a celestial or Iron Man? The answer is a resounding yes. So believe it or not, this hijacked celestial body is actually supposed to be a Hulkbuster model because when you're dealing with the strongest being on Earth, you can't be too cautious. As a Hulkbuster, the celestial has been retrofitted with technology designed to drain the gamma radiation out of the Hulk so that he could be safely apprehended. Though unfortunately, things don't go quite as planned because the Hulk is actually able to replenish his gamma rays self-sufficiently. Now maybe the Iron Man still would have been able to beat the Hulk, but we'll never truly know since the armor was was 
accidentally struck by Thor's hammer as he's been unable to completely control it on account of the fact that Odin's soul is trapped inside of it. Now even despite getting a blow from Mjolnir and being put into critical condition, the armor was still able to battle for a few more pages on account of its ability to repair and heal itself autonomously, a feature which every Iron Man suit and iPhone should have. It even sucked back a direct hit from the Hulk's rage-induced eye lasers, that's a new one. But ultimately, the suit was destroyed after a pinned down Hulk released a nuclear blast of radiation big enough to be seen from space, and it still protected Tony from getting fried to a crisp inside. Look. I don't care if it ultimately lost the fight, the fact that it stood up for so long against the Hulk and Mjolnir simultaneously puts the suit of armor in a league of its own. At number 6 we have the Iron Destroyer. Here's a freaking awesome mashup of Iron Man's design with that of the Destroyer, the iconic enchanted suit of Asgardian armor. Iron Man's bleeding edge nanotech armor was already a huge upgrade from his previous designs, but during the War of the Serpent which saw numerous villains sport Asgardian weapons, Odin was left with no choice but to give Tony access to the legendary Nordic Forge of Navaldir where he utilized Uru, which is the Asgardian metal that composes Mjolnir, Thor's hammer, to give himself and his fellow Avengers some epic Asgardian upgrades. And so, after Tony and the dwarves designed some new tools for the homies, Stark got into his bleeding edge suit and lowered himself into the vat of molten Uru, and after receiving a divine blessing from Odin, the bleeding edge armor infused with the Uru, evolving it into the Iron Destroyer. Now once the battle was over, Tony gave all that Uru back to Odin, but while he had it, the man's suit of armor was indestructible. Cause, ladies and gentlemen, unless you're your name is Hela, this sexy suit is basically invincible. Now, we know that one of the properties of Uru is the absorption of magic, so we can infer that the Iron Destroyer sports similar abilities, but unfortunately, we'll never know for certain because the armor didn't even get a singular battle scene, despite countless pages of hype and buildup, making this suit the second biggest missed opportunity in Iron Man's history. That's right, second. And here's the first. At number 5, the Galactus Buster. No entry on this list makes me geek out as much as this one does, because for those of you who don't know, and I'm assuming that's most of you because the only way you would have ever seen this panel of art is if you had used Iron Man to defeat Galactus and unlocked his ending in Marvel vs. Capcom 3. That's a video game for all you boomers out there. <laughs> That single sarcastic comment is gonna earn me leagues of hate. I can already feel it. <laughs> wow, I've been playing Marvel vs. Capcom games since before you were born. Yeah, okay, save it, Gramps. So like I was saying, the only trace of this suit's existence would have come in those two panels that conclude Tony's ending in the game, as well as a few lines of monologue where Stark explains that while he did defeat Galactus, he only barely managed to do so, and you, and so using data collected during his fight, he fashioned himself the Galactus Buster armor to ensure that he would be better prepared in case the cosmic planet eater ever came back for seconds. Now the only other time we get to see a Galactus Iron Man combo like this is in the unused cover art which was teased for the Armor War Saga. And while the Galactus Buster's appearance in this series would have been monumental, both figuratively and literally, we sadly happen to inhabit the reality in which that's all we were given. And it's a shame too, cause this particular character mashup is a cosmically sized missed opportunity. At number 4, the God Killer Armor. At number 4, the God Killer Armor. If we weren't already in S tier, we definitely are now. After discovering the remains of a Celestial locked away inside of a Dyson Sphere out there in the Cosmos, some Regellian recorder decided that the armor would best be used as essentially a nuclear deterrent to bring about world peace to the universe. Cause you know, the only way to achieve world peace is obviously through bigger, more destructive weapons. Dunce. Anyways, this recorder needed a perfect pilot, and to that end, he selected Howard Stark and genetically engineered his unborn son in order to conceive of a suitable pilot for the celestial body. But even after turning Tony into a GMO, along with countless other unspeakable atrocities, in the end Tony was unable to control the armor, and so all that effort was in vain. Realizing this, the recorder transported the armor to an empty dimension where it could never fall into the wrong hands. That is, until Tony took what he learned and made a version of his own, because of course he did! He keeps his absolute megalith of but Mark II in standby orbiting around Mars. And just to add a little extra flex on Elon, the suit can be summoned to Earth in a matter of minutes without exploding. A feat that could only be possible if the thing was traveling at or close to the speed of freaking light. Now this is able to be accomplished by the fact that this bad boy is powered by not one, not two, but eight nuclear reactors. Now although this suit is ultimately defeated, it took an entire celestial horde to do it. But just the fact that this giant hunk of metal can even stand up against a single dark celestial goes vastly beyond the realm of impressive. At number 3, God Buster. Now before I get into this one, the comics can't decide whether to call this one the God Buster or God Killer, but, but Tony himself introduces it as the God Buster, <clears throat> so that's what I'll be going with to distinguish it from the last entry. The God Buster suit of armor represents the very pinnacle of Stark's engineering genius, and has even been described as quote, Tony 
Sony's masterpiece, the ultimate weapon. Now for as epic as this ultimate weapon is, unfortunately, Tony has the suit destroyed along with all the components required for its construction almost as soon as he builds it, as Tony himself believed that the suit was simply too powerful to even be allowed to exist. Hot damn. As a matter of fact, the armor was so intricate in design that it shouldn't even be physically possible to even conceive of its design in the first place, as he was only able to do so within the confines of the virtual reality he developed called Escape. This allowed him to utilize the upper limits of his unleashed imagination from the restraints of the human brain. After coming back from the Escape, Tony used his bleeding edge 3D printers to construct the armor in real life, albeit with the limitations of his meaty monkey brain still causing the intricacies of the design to fade from his memory. But what are the features that deem this suit worthy of such hype? Well, well aside from the ultra powerful unibeam and the fact that this suit seems to have gotten hidden repulsor cannons out the wazoo, <clears throat> we don't really get much action from the Godbuster. All we can really do is take Stark's word for it. At number two is Emperor Stark. Okay, this next entry is a bit of a tangent from the others, but I'm including it here because this alternate Tony was elected Emperor of the Planet for life, making him quite literally the most powerful person on Earth. Meaning this entry is supremely powerful thanks to a technicality, not his armor. So if you want to cut to the most powerful Iron Man suit of all time, go ahead and skip to number one. But as for Emperor Stark, although from the outside it may seem that this reluctant hero was given that mantle with a heavy and humble heart, in reality it was Tony's plan all along to assume dominance as the undisputed monarch of Earth as he engineered the very threats that forced the world to yield their power over to him. Firstly, he secretly orchestrated the mutant war simply in an attempt to thin out the world's superhuman population with Captain America and Mr. Fantastic among the defeated. So after betraying his race and secretly helping the mutants win the war for the promise of co-dominating the planet, he then went and betrayed Magneto, making this double-crossing double-crosser the hero of the conflict. But according to Tony, soldiers don't make for good leaders, so his ascension to power truly began during the Great Famine, when a powerful virus, which was secretly developed by Stark Industries, not unlike the mad cow disease, left most animals unfit for human consumption. And within a year of the outbreak, a new strain of fungal rot also secretly developed by Stark, devastated half the world's wheat population and millions of lives were lost to famine. Until Tony came out later with vaccines and countermeasures that would earn him a Nobel Prize and eventually lead to his presidential candidacy after winning the election by a landslide. And once he developed a tech to control weather and seismic activity to cause natural disasters of biblical proportions while simultaneously pulling some strings to cause economic collapse, he got the other nations of the world to yield their power over to him voluntarily. In the end, all he had to do was stage a battle with Dr. Doom which completely leveled Washington DC, from the face of the earth nearly every federally elected representative, the entire Supreme Court, and along with them, America's democratic system, making evil Tony over here one of the most formidable beings to ever dominate the world. Oh, and I guess his suit ain't too shabby either, although there's nothing that sets it apart from the other Iron Man suits besides the cape. At number one, we have Iron God. Just when you thought his suits couldn't get any more absurdly powerful, boom. Iron God. This stupendously powerful suit of armor is a divine makeover of Model 70 after Stark and Korvac were bestowed with the unthinkable godlike abilities thanks to the power cosmic, the essence of the cosmos itself. Then the two unleash those powers upon each other in the most epic space battle of cosmic proportions, crashing into moons and using entire planets as launching pads and naturally causing collateral chaos on an interplanetary and even interdimensional scale that gets so out of hand that the living tribunal themselves have to step in to help end the fight, bringing along with them some extra equally powerful cosmic beings for good measure. After apprehending Korvac, the tribunal decides to let Stark retain his divinity and so Stark goes back to Earth now capable of transforming the world as he sees fit. His first gift to Earth as Iron God was to bestow everyone in the city with his genius level intelligence to the dismay of Freed Richards who says he actually feels a bit dumber. He turns haters into yes men with a snap of his fingers, turns Silver Surfer into a silver puddle, and well on that note, pretty much one shot every single hero who disagreed with him. It wasn't until he won punched Rhodey so hard his head turned all the way around that he realized his power had gotten to his head. So he revives everybody and apologizes profusely, eventually giving up the power cosmic. Biggest reason why narcissists shouldn't be gods, but while he was one, if you want to look for OP, then look no further. The only limits of Iron God's powers are his imagination, which makes this suit of armor the most powerful Iron Man suit of all time, hands down. At number 10, we have a pretty obscure and short-lived armor that appears in Fantastic Four number 375, only 25 issues after his true self is finally revealed. So why does he already need a suit upgrade after 25 issues? Well to absorb the power of a Watcher, of course. Watchers, if you don't know, are one of the most powerful, omnipotent, and oldest beings in the cosmos. We all know that Dr. Doom's abilities allow him to absorb powers from others, but to have a specific suit made so he could actually absorb a Watcher is a huge step in the right direction for him and a huge step 
in the wrong direction for the good guys. It's unclear why his normal armor couldn't absorb the likes of a Watcher without an upgrade, but it seems to be due to the fact that this armor is just stronger. And it also has spikes on it, which is always cool. All right, at number nine is a pretty fun one. Are you ready? Doom the Living Planet. Okay, this is the suit of all suits. He is literally a planet. Now, this takes the definition of suit to a new place for this list, and it's important we hatch this out now. I'm considering any change of appearance of Doom as a new suit, as long as his abilities change, and or the new appearance also gives him added useful advantages. So. How Dr. Doom finds himself in this position, turning into a planet, is that he's basically getting older and senses that he's gonna die soon. So he basically morphs with the powers of Ego the Living Planet and buys himself more time in existence. In the form of, once again, a planet who wipes out life on Earth entirely, or the humans at least. But what makes this suit it's a suit, all right? I'm putting my foot down on that. What makes this suit so useful is that aside from it granting so much power that he can take out all of humanity, it grants him more time to live in his old age. So granting extended life sort of surpasses the term useful and goes into the territory of amazing, unmatched, unfairly beneficial. It also allows Doom to spend more time scheming and finding ways to push his agenda and make everyone else's lives just a little harder. At number eight is the Blue Beetle Armor. This hyper adaptive and seemingly sentient armor proves that sometimes the suit really does make the man or whatever the saying is. And in this case, I'm referring to Jamie Ray's Blue Beetle armor, which has been known to withstand attacks from the likes of Superman and Green Lantern. But aside from the amazing defensive stat that the suit offers, there's also a whole array of offensive potential that it brings to the table. For example, due to the suit's symbiotic nature, it can actually craft weapons on command that best suit the enemy the wearer is facing in the moment. Like the time when Superman is in opposition to Blue Beetle and the suit crafts kryptonite weapons in preparation for the fight. A suit that's basically alive and has the ability to turn any regular mortal into a pretty high ranking superhero definitely deserves a spot on this list and would rank much higher if we didn't have plenty more powerful entries to cover coming up. At number seven is the Hellbat armor worn by Bruce Wayne. Forged by the rest of the Justice League, the Hellbat armor is what you get when you befriend the most powerful and influential superheroes in the DC universe. And considering that Batman began as a super powerless detective, seeing him wearing this suit of armor gives us pause for a moment, realizing how far he's really come. The suit is given a speed test by the Flash, it's given a technological foundation designed by Cyborg, and is forged in the center of the sun by Superman himself. The armor is so powerful that the intention in creating it is to help a human with no superhuman abilities withstand the cosmic level escapades that arrive on the Justice League's doorstep on the daily. The only downside for the suit is that it runs on Bruce Wayne's metabolism and eventually kills him if worn for too long but he's got some good friends to ensure he doesn't take it too far. I mean, not everyone gets to say that their friends have crafted them superpowered suits of armor just to make them feel included. At number six is the very powerful, one and only Black Panther suit, Black Panther Habit. I think it's fair to say that the Wakandans have the technology and armor game on lock, with only Tony Stark as their competition at this point. With their access to vast vibranium reserves right on their home soil, they can craft some of the most invulnerable and dynamic super suits of all time. The suit T'Challa wears is known to be totally bulletproof and nearly indestructible, all while staying totally lightweight and aerodynamic. But the most notable feature is, of course, the energy redistribution property which vibranium offers by nature. And taking advantage of this feature, Shuri's craftsmanship allows for the suit to let out a kinetic energy pulse on command, which proves to be one of the defining features of the suit. Black Panther Habit is also outfitted with a dynamic comm system and the signature vibranium claws, which T'Challa uses to slice through, ironically, some of the toughest armors out there. Not to mention the suit can materialize onto the wearer on command, making it just about as versatile as it could ever need to be. At number five, we have armor, like the hero named armor, the mutant named armor's armor. First appearing in Joss Whedon's astonishing X-Men, Hisako Ichiki is a superhero who goes by the mantle 
armor. She has the power to summon a transparent suit of armor, which grows in durability based on her memories of her ancestors. Basically, the more members of her bloodline die, the stronger the armor will get. This suggests that the armor doesn't really have a ceiling on how powerful it can become. Hisako also has the ability to control the size and weaponry of the armor on command, one time even holding her own in a face off against Fing Fang Foom. The only weaknesses the armor has are that it can't block lasers and it can't block adamantium. This is demonstrated when Wolverine's claws pass right through the suit but stop when his fist is held back from pushing them in any further. Although this is a pretty significant set of vulnerabilities, the armor is so durable that it still deserves a higher spot on this list. I mean, it can withstand a blow by the Muramasa blade, which is known to kill regenerative mutants with ease. So. There's that. At number four, we have Spider-Man's Iron Spider Armor, designed by Stark Industries. This suit sports the signature Waldos, as they're called, on his back, which help with everything from mobility to reconnaissance, since each arm has a high-def camera on the tip. It also has a glider built in, which can greatly extend the distance between web swings. Of course, it has a massively increased durability stat and a mask filter that can be used to protect against dangerous gases and even used for underwater navigation as long as it doesn't exceed the 8 minute compressed air capacity. And just to keep Spidey from needing to use his own regeneration powers, the suit itself has its own repair system that can self repair damage in real time. This suit has it all, and when Spider-Man is given this much to work with in combination with his already versatile power set, it's easy to imagine how much more effective of a hero he can be. At number 3 is Batman's Justice Buster armor. With all the insane suits that Bruce Wayne has used over the years, you best believe that there'd be another of his on this list. As the name suggests, the suit is originally designed to combat the Justice League when they go against him during Batman Endgame. Quite different from the Hellbat armor, it's kind of the opposite. For the Flash, there's the Red Run gun controlled by an aimbot with servers that process at speeds faster than the Flash's movements. For Aquaman, there's a shoulder cannon that fires this pink foam which dehydrates the target. Then there's an electromagnetic nerve tree, as it's called, which can paralyze Cyborg's mechanical operations. For the Green Lantern, there's a citrine neutralizer which uses yellow quartz to prevent him from using his powers endowed by the ring. And for Wonder Woman, it's got the bind of veils, which is an interesting one. It's a lasso made of an ancient sheep's wool that entraps the target and freezes them in a state of perceived victory since Wonder Woman never relents. And finally, for Superman, there is a plasma shield that deflects his heat vision, as well as the red giant knuckles, which contain multiple miniature red suns, which are another of Superman's weaknesses. So although these features are quite particular to a battle with the Justice League, there's no question that this suit is one of the most powerful superhero suits of all time. At number two, we have the XO Man of War armor. At number two, we have the XO Man of War armor. This is the only entry on the list that comes from Valiant Comics, and it's a big one. This suit of armor is unique in that it is so powerful that it has its own presence and reputation before the wearer even comes into play. Almost like the Destroyer armor, which is an honorable mention on this list. But the Man of War armor is actually guilty of killing its wearers if it deems they aren't worthy of its use. But when it does find a user, boy does it offer a huge power boost. When it chooses its new owner, Arik, the suit literally makes him into a king. By putting on the suit, the the wearer basically gets the benefit of laser blasters, an extremely durable exoskeleton, and of course the gift of flight, among many other benefits. The suit also brings the Chosen One a huge level of respect considering the armor itself is ancient and has been worshipped like a god by an entire race of people for centuries. On a list about powerful suits, this just strikes me as the suit of all suits and only gets clinched for the first position because of who rightfully deserves it overall. And that is Iron Man at number one with the Godbuster aka Model 63 armor. First appearing in Tony Stark Iron Man number 10, this suit of armor is just beyond comprehension in so many ways, to the point where after designing it, Stark actually feels the need to destroy it immediately after. First designing the suit in a virtual reality system called Escape, Stark has free reign to design any suit he could ever dream of 
with limitless capabilities. And what we end up with is the Godbuster armor. And once it comes to life in the VR landscape, Tony decides he wants to create a real one. What's slightly frustrating about this armor though is that not much is known about its true capabilities because of how quickly it's put out of commission. But Tony's brother Arno deems it Tony's masterpiece and Ironheart gets unprecedented power level readings when she scans it. We can assume that the massive cannon on the back and the complex network of tubes and wires have the ability to stop even the most powerful of enemies, but that's still all we really know about it. Either way, if one was to doubt this suit's abilities, I could easily replace this number one spot with Iron Man's God Killer Mark II armor, which deserves this spot just as readily. Sorry, but Tony Stark is just the king of super suits. It's all he's got after all. At number 10, we have the Sapien Deathmatch armor. Not only does this suit have an absolutely bad name, but it's even got the design to match, looking more like a mech from manga or anime than anything else. The suit made its debut during the House of M storyline, where a war between humans and mutants occurs after Scarlet Witch does some reality rewriting. In this reality, Stark Industries was contracted to create the Sentinels, but thanks to Howard Stark, those very same Sentinels end up fighting against Tony, not alongside him. So in retaliation, Tony builds himself this epic suit of armor in secret. The suit's most prominent feature was this extendable hand cannon, though it boasts countless other weapons, from unibeams to heat seeking missiles to tasers to flamethrowers, and of course, what Iron Man's suit would be complete without the obligatory repulsor beam. But the suit's wackiest feature has got to be those massive wings with a design that looks to be inspired by my air conditioner. But before I start bringing down the real powerful suits of armor, if you're enjoying this video so far, you can support the channel by pressing like, subscribing to Top 10 Nerd, and ringing that notification bell. Now that that mandatory plea for engagement is over, let's talk number 9, Anti-Transformer Armor. Forget DC, I want to see some Marvel V Transformer action on the big screen, baby. But until that faithful day comes, we're just gonna have to be content with the Avengers Transformers comic book saga from back in 07. See, Tony is a fan of making tailored suits of armors to serve as contingency plans, like in the case of the Hulkbuster for example. So you already know that when Tony heard of rumors of giant alien robots hiding amongst the citizens of Earth, he just had to go and whip up a brand new suit of armor specifically designed to combat the new threat, mano a mano. However, considering the sheer scale of the project, Stark ended up needing a lot more time to build the thing than he got, forcing him to put the suit into action to despite utilizing a battery pack which severely undersupplied the suit's vast energy demands, leading to power management issues which would lead this energy intensive behemoth of a suit to run out of juice quite quickly. Tony tried to circumvent this problem on the fly with the help of Optimus Prime by routing the battery to an external power supply, but doing so presented an equal and opposite problem, as fueling the suit in this way caused it to be prone to overloading the battery. Alright, at number 8 is the Power Cosmic Suit. In Fantastic Four issue 60, Doctor Doom steals the Power Cosmic from the Silver Surfer which gives him a huge boost in powers and abilities, naturally. If you're unfamiliar with the Power Cosmic, basically it's a source of almost limitless power, originally honed by Galactus himself. And given Doctor Doom's ability to absorb the power of others, of course his sights are set on gaining this enormous advantage from the Silver Surfer. The only reason why this suit isn't higher up on the list is because it's arguable that these abilities aren't synonymous with the suit he's wearing for his short time wielding the power cosmic. However, he does gain an accessory that would argue counts as part of his suit, and that is the Silver Surfer's board. Although for the span of only two issues, Doctor Doom is able to fly around the world at unmatched speeds, absorb basically any energy near him, create energy blasts from nothing, and manipulate matter like he is a god. I mean, he arguably is a god for this time, but even if all he acquired was the Silver Surfer's board, that's still a huge benefit that would still put him on this list. Next up at number 7 is the Secret Wars number 1 armor. This armor gains a sleek design and a more vast power set after he absorbs the powers of the Beyonder. During this storyline, the Beyonder takes basically every superhero and supervillain and places them into a world called Battle World to face off for a prize of their choosing. So, as they all start to fight, Doctor Doom sets his sights elsewhere. He decides to focus on the master of ceremonies himself, the Beyonder, and he gets what he wants, absorbing the Beyonder's nearly limitless power and transforming into a giant version of himself. This also changes his armor to be more streamlined as well, making him all around more capable of taking on foes in this Hunger Games-esque world. He even uses his newfound power to blast none other than Captain America to smithereens and also Kang the Conqueror, along with a few other superheroes. He's 
basically a god. And this suit only sits further back on this list because it may not be the suit itself giving him the extra advantage here. But his armor does change in appearance with his newfound power, so... The rules I said earlier still apply. So even if this power comes first, it's forever attached to this particular Doctor Doom suit from this storyline. Fight me on it in the comments. I'll reply to you. Okay, at number six, we have the suit worn by Victor Von Doom during the Secret Wars 2 storyline. This time, the multiverse is at stake, and multiple versions of Earth are in danger of colliding with one another. So the heroes and villains alike are tasked with trying to stop this from happening naturally. And with Doctor Doom being one of the most powerful out of all of them, he decides to take the lead on this project. But what really gives him the extra boost and lands this suit near the top of the list is when Molecule Man basically endows him with the power to manipulate pretty much any matter that exists in reality in any way that he wants. And when he's given this strength, his suit also changes its look, giving Doom the new moniker of God Emperor Doom. This suit has a sweet silver design, making Doctor Doom look more like an actual god than ever before. And for good reason too, because he sort of is. And lots of godlike suits on this list so far. Anyway, when Namor and Black Panther try to take him on, they think they've killed him with a spear throw because he explodes into little pieces. But much to their dismay, he regenerates, muttering something like, ouch, that hurt. This is a brand new level for Victor Von Doom, who can also create whole planets now from nothing, which he does in an attempt to solve the collapsing multiverse. And well, do we all agree that this is due to the suit he wears? Maybe not. But he rips Thanos' spine out of his body with his bare hands. So I felt like I had to put this iteration of Doom on the list. His suit changes. And maybe Molecule Man endowed the suit with abilities instead of Victor himself. A stretch, once again. Let's fight it out in the comments. At number five, we have the Doom 2099 suit. In the series Doom 2099, Doctor Doom travels to the future to Latveria, the fictional European country that Doctor Doom is normally the ruler of. But somebody named Tiger Wild is in his place, and his advanced technology is just too much for Doctor Doom to handle. So, what does Doctor Doom do? He goes back to the workshop and builds himself what is basically known to be his strongest and most advanced armor yet. Aside from just looking really cool, this suit has a few new upgrades that help him get his old position of power back. This would include a phase shifter, which allows him to pass through solid objects, as well as a cyberspace link built into his armor. This allows him to gain access to cyberspace almost instantly and anywhere he is, as long as he's wearing the armor. Naturally, this helps helps Doom get his power back as he fights for Latveria alongside his allies. It's impressive what new armor can do to get you back on track, even when you're already one of the most powerful supervillains in the cosmos. Okay, at number four is Doctor Doom's Vibranium Suit. This suit is put together by Doctor Doom when he swoops into Wakanda and steals a bunch of their Vibranium Reserves. For those of you who don't know Vibranium, it's basically a highly durable metal that can absorb sonic energy, basically taking all of the force out of any impact that makes contact with the material. Due to this metal's abilities, it's one of the most valuable in the world. So when Wakanda finds itself vulnerable, Doctor Doom takes advantage and steals a bunch of it. The suit he makes looks pretty cool too, taking on a really menacing look with spikes and a glowing chest piece. But one of the biggest uses for this suit is that it apparently helps the wearer see all of the vibranium in the world. So for someone who's interested in strengthening their own personal weaponry or putting together a powerful army, this suit isn't just beneficial in its power. There's a huge advantage to locating and gaining access to the raw materials needed for a powerful, well-armored army. And Doctor Doom knows this, so his sights are then, by all means, set on finding more vibranium with this suit's new ability. Luckily for Wakanda, but also sort of sadly for them too, T'Challa is forced to render all the vibranium in the world powerless, making it also useless in its powers. At least for the uses that Doctor Doom had planned for. But yeah, the Doctor Doom vibranium suit. For the time being, it was pretty dang useful. At number three is the Dr. Juggernaut suit from the Heroes Reborn crossover event in 2021. In this storyline, Victor Von Doom is after more riches, but this time, specifically the Gem of Sidorak, which, if you know your X-Men lore, is the source that gives Juggernaut his powers. And his look, I guess, because Doctor Doom doesn't just gain the insane super strength of Juggernaut, he also takes on the appearance of the villain as well. This suit is huge, 
bulky and gives Doom enough confidence to try and take over the United States of America. He goes in and attacks different locations in Washington DC in the hopes of setting himself up with a new moniker of President of the United States. Why are the all these villains always after taking over America? I mean, don't they also find themselves going out into the cosmos to wage war for much greater causes and higher stakes? I guess there's just something about the White House that really gets these guys going. Anyway, this suit is sort of short lived because Hyperion comes in and banishes Doctor Doom to the negative zone. I guess he just flies a little too close to the sun on this one. I mean, let's be honest, a target is painted right on his back as soon as he pairs up his powers with Juggernaut. They had to put a stop to that before it got out of hand. Next up at number 2 is the 2099 upgraded suit. Yes, believe it or not, there are two versions of the Doctor Doom suit in this storyline. As he's pushing to take back Latveria, his allies start to question his abilities and even his identity, wondering if it's truly the real Doctor Doom behind the suit. So, as he finally gets control back over his country, he also decides he wants to take over the US as well. See? That strange obsession with taking over America again. Anyway, in this event, he decides to flaunt his superiority by upgrading his suit again. And above all the abilities that this suit might have, it just looks the coolest out of any others on this list. At this point, he's upgraded his abilities to offer him a remote that automatically activates his time platform for him when he needs it, as well as a return to form with his boom bots and the classic shrink ray. He also covers his eye slits with a red glass making his appearance that much more menacing. And the biggest use of this suit in that crucial moment for Victor which puts it higher on this list is the simple yet essential function of galvanizing his troops and reminding them who their true leader is in a time when he's in danger of losing his followers. Ok, finally at number 1 we have the Doctor Doom infamous Iron Man suit. So after the events of Civil War 2, Doctor Doom's mask has come off and he's suddenly ready to try and make up for his past evil deeds. And coincidentally, Tony Stark also seems to be ready for a replacement. So Doom makes it his prerogative to take up the role of Iron Man and play hero for a while. The suit he wears as the new infamous Iron Man looks basically sort of how you'd imagine it looking. It's like an upgraded Iron Man suit with the iconic Doctor Doom cloak. But something about this combo just looks so just so cool. And it appears that it has some pretty unique features as well like what appears to be a certain level of protection against harm without the suit even being activated yet. Which is probably Doom's iconic force field. But mixed with the access to blasts of energy out of his hands and as well as flight and increased strength, it's pretty much a powerhouse having Doctor Doom and Iron Man's abilities mixed all into one suit. Iron Man with force fields, Doctor Doom with jet boots, need I say more, this suit is definitely something new for Victor and a good way for him to start on his path of good. I'd say hold on to this suit for future use Victor, it might come in handy many more times in the future. At number 10 we we have Steel. The origins of this hero are very wholesome with Dr. John Henry finding motivation to become the newest version of Superman after trying to save the Kryptonian from Doomsday. And when he completes his mission he ends up with one of the most powerful armors out of any comic book superhero ever. After showing his potential as a superhero with a massive sledgehammer and the courage to face Doomsday himself, John takes it upon himself to craft a fully protective super suit and go by the name of Steel. On top of the offensive capabilities that his smart hammer offers, his suit brings to the table all the defensive stats he could ever need, as well as the mobility of a flying superhero due to the rocket boots attached to the armor as well. It's an all around impressive piece of armor and endows steel with enough protection to withstand attacks from the likes of the Eradicator as he tries to live up to one of the most coveted symbols to ever be worn on a superhero's chest. At number 9 we have the Rocket Red Armor. Referring to the armor given to the Rocket Red Brigade members during the Green Lantern Corps comics, this dynamic armor deserves a spot on this list even if it comes as a bit obscure to some fans. This army of Soviet heroes are equipped with some of the most impressive armor out of any superhero. Aside from giving the wearer flight capabilities and upgraded defensive stats, the suits are even known to, in some cases, present a special 
mecha sense, meaning that the suit can influence other machines and take control of their movements for a time. Now, one rocket red suit is nothing compared to the Iron Man armor, which we'll of course be exploring later, but the fact that these suits seem to be mass produced and are easy enough to navigate, the suit gets a major power boost, especially given that multiple rocket red soldiers seem to be able to work them with what appears to be total ease. Number eight, the Powers International Bat Suit. Coming to us from Batman Super Heavy by Scott Snyder and Greg Capullo, the mechanized bat suit taking up our slot today is the GCPD's answer to what they can do when Batman himself is no longer around. In his place, Jim Gordon was chosen to step in as the new Cape Crusader, but of course, Jim isn't Bruce, and so the GCPD bat suit compensates for his lacking level of combat training. The suit itself was designed by Powers International and features electrified batarangs, thermal sonic arm cannons, cape shaped bomb shield, digital camouflage, thermal detection vision, multi response missile pods, and a built in EKJ slash defibrillator slash ambulatory response system. That's a lot. The suit also doubles as a backup, operating somewhat autonomously on a nimble auto program, giving the suit enough combat know how to effectively wield a pair of sharks as melee weapons. What is he, what even is that? Also, unlike Iron Man, this suit looks like Batman, which is obviously a positive. Number seven, Dark Hawk. Not enough people talk about Dark Hawk. A lot of people don't even know who this hero is, and that's ridiculous because he is Dope. Even in his regular suit of armor, Dark Hawk is pretty powerful compared to Iron Man. The suit has the ability to literally travel through time, which we know that Tony's couldn't hope to even attempt, except for in the MCU. He's actually probably totally capable of time travel, but this is just a part of Dark Hawk's base suit. The Dark Hawk suit is advanced Shi'ar technology meshed with magic, which does a hell of a lot. Other than augmenting physical attributes, it can manifest offensive and defensive tools and is capable of traveling through space. Similar to Iron Man, Dark Hawk has a few different versions of his suits with different capabilities, but one of the best Dark Hawk pieces of armor was his Infinity Countdown suit, which looked cooler than the original, but it actually looks a little bit more like a mech, and it had to have the power to take down Geyer's army of raptors. Such an underrated hero with such an awesome suit. Number six. Steel. When Superman fell at the hands of Doomsday, it was kind of a huge deal. In his place, a whole handful of heroes and even villains came in to try and fill the gap. One of them was the Man of Steel, Dr. John Henry Irons, or as we know him now, just Steel. When Superman was about to be taken off the board by Doomsday, Irons grabbed a big old sledgehammer and tried to fight the monster before being buried under a pile of rubble. Superman's sacrifice and the fact that he saved John motivated John to make a heroic mantle in honor of Superman, crafting his own super suit. Steel's power armor grants him a variety of abilities that enable him to be an effective Superman, and that factor alone puts the suit on a higher level than Iron Man. It just does. But besides the flight, strength, and endurance, kind of the most impressive piece of Steel's arsenal is his smart hammer. This hammer is so cool. It hits harder the further it is thrown, it can fly, and it can seek out the weak points of a target thanks to an onboard computer guidance system. It's almost like me Mjolnir, but not magical. Number five, Black Panther. You may not immediately think of Black Panther when thinking of powerful suits, and I think that's because the Wakandan technology in it is so advanced and stylistic that it's easy to forget that it even has those technologies in the first place. The obvious difference between Iron Man's armor and Black Panther's panther habit is that one is made of vibranium, which is stronger than almost any other material. But its strength is just part of the benefit. It can also absorb, store, and release kinetic energy, giving it quite a bit more power material-wise than Tony's suits. That's because Iron Man's armor is traditionally made out of nickel titanium alloy, and that's that's pretty strong, I guess, but nothing compared to vibranium. Black Panther's iconic suit, on the other hand, is extremely resilient, and the material actually helps act as both a protectant and as a weapon. But then there are all the extra goodies. The lenses in the mask cut glare and enhance the Panther's natural night vision, and allow him to see in infrared and other visual spectrums. The claws can break down other metals on the molecular level. It has energy dampening boots, disguise and teleportation technology, and as most of us know from the MCU, it can release basically a force push, which is always cool. Number four, the Hellbat suit. So we all know Batman is just a dude in a bat suit. He has to use his ingenuity and skill to defeat threats that metahumans can face one on one. But when the threat is too great, the metahumans he works with on the daily 
help him out. Enter the Hellbat suit. In Batman and Robin number 33 by Peter Tomasi and Patrick Gleason, the Hellbat is the Justice League's gift to Batman. The Hellbat suit was actually forged by Superman inside of the sun. The Hellbat armor allows Batman to fly, run at super speed, while also boosting up his strength and durability. It comes with adaptive camouflage, a unibeam style energy blast, and a shape shifting cape that turns into bats when it's ripped off. Obviously though, it has to have a downside or there's no reason Bruce wouldn't wear it all the time. And that downside is that the suit slowly drains Bruce Wayne's life force and would actually put him in the grave if he wore it for too long. There's always a catch. Number three, the destroyer armor. To call the destroyer a suit feels almost wrong. It's more like a robot, but at the same time, various characters have technically inhabited the armor. But with their souls, which become overridden with the destroyer's sole purpose of battle and destruction. I could be wrong, but I don't believe there are any moments where a person physically inhabits the suit in the 616 continuity, but if there is, let me know in the comments down below. The destroyer is extremely powerful and was created out of an unknown metal by Odin that was even stronger than Uru metal and stored various gods' energies, making it a level of magical power that exceeds almost any technological suit. I mean, the thing was created in order to battle the Celestials. So on that statement alone, it far exceeds most of Tony's suits. Most. I say most. In his normal suits, Tony really struggles to take on Asgardians, and he's been pummeled by Thor way too many times to count. That being said, the Destroyer has pummeled the Helheim out of Thor so many times. The Destroyer has been able to tank hits from Odin himself, and he made the thing. Number two, the Justice Buster. Another Batman suit. Sorry. In the end game story, the Joker has twisted the other members of the Justice League with his Joker toxin, meaning we get to see Batman take them all on. While we know Bruce has contingencies for each member of the League, Batman instead in this story dons an armor that has the capability to subdue every single main member of the Justice League. The Justice Buster Armor. Using this suit, or I guess it's better to call it a mechanized armor, Batman puts Wonder Woman in a dream state, maps out the Flash's movements and causes him to slip and crash into a building, knocking him out. He fires a foam made up of magnesium carbonate at Aquaman that envelops him and drains him of the moisture in his body the more he struggles, and then Superman shows up. The Justice Buster has plasma shields to deflect eye beams, thrusters, and thermals to deter frost breath, but this is a Superman that isn't pulling his punches. When Superman gets through this armor, it doesn't actually matter though. Batman spits a polymer lace with green kryptonite dust into Superman's eyes, rendering him completely powerless. Batman. And finally, in at number one, it's Apocalypse's Celestial Armor. Being one of the first mutants on the planet Earth with the ability to manipulate his own molecular structure, N. Sabanur, or Apocalypse, is an extremely powerful villain in Marvel Comics. But that was before his run-ins with Celestials. His original ability to control his molecular structure was augmented by Celestial technology, but then further enhanced through the Celestial Armor he wears to make him the evolutionary caretaker. This armor comes with a title, and that's pretty cool. Other than titles and really cool celestial systems, the armor gives him some other abilities he wouldn't normally possess, like teleportation, the ability to mentally link with and control almost any kind of tech and machinery, celestial energy shields and blasts, and most importantly, the armor pushes his own abilities even further, allowing him to grant himself almost any superpower he wants. It's nuts. A suit created by Celestials is just going to rival almost anything that Tony Stark can come up with. Almost anything. Thank you.